In accordance with the Open Public Meetings Act, NJSA 1046 at SEC, adequate notice of this meeting has been provided by advertising the Star Ledger, El Nuevo Coqui, Haiti Progress, and Luz Americana Newspapers, and by distribution to the administrative offices of the Newark Public Schools. A copy of the meeting notice was also forwarded to City Hall for posting. This is a board business meeting for Tuesday, August 18th, 2015. Roll call. Flag salute, ma'am. Flag salute, sorry. <laughs> Ms. Basketball Richardson. Here. Ms. Carter. Here. Ms. Von Seca. Here. Mr. Hassan. Present. Mr. Jackson. Present. Mr. Lewis. Present. Mr. Rashidi. Mr. Selinger. Present. Chair Perello. Present. Quorum is present, Madam Chair. Thank you very much. Um, I would like to welcome everyone present um, here today. Um, I am excited to have the first um, meeting for the 2015-2016 school year. Um, welcome once again to all board members. Um, we are delighted and excited to start this year fresh and working ready and working for our children here in the city of Newark. Thank you to the public for your attendance. and. Let's start this meeting with the committee's report. Let's first start off with Mr. Donald Jackson. Good afternoon, Madam Chair, other board colleagues, and more importantly, residents and students of North Public Schools. Operations Committee meeting started promptly at 5.30 p.m. Uh, first topic was school cleaning update. Overall, between 65% and 75% of schools were completed. Uh, two Saturdays ago, support staff was sent to 19 summer school sites to get caught up in cleaning. Uh, but then staff were also added to the schools. Management of facilities. Management must check schools and report progress of cleaning. At the schools, principals filled out surveys and any concerns were given back to the individual managers to correct and change. Managers must have answers for the problems and solutions to correct the issues. Uh, another issue were repairs. I asked for repairs needed throughout the district. Um, answer from the district was a late start because of the budget materials. At that point, we're coming in and the district is looking at the project plan. The DM trade workers are coming in and will help accelerate the work. Any work that can't get completed will be scheduled for a later date. Roofing, a uh, contractor will come in and look deeper into the problem. Uh, the main projects that were being focused on now were for health and safety concerns and essential repairs. Uh, we went back to the budget question, uh, and the budget, is, and it was reported by the district, the budget is assessed uh, buildings and project base. Uh, the projects start at a zero base, and they do not have a, a specific amount. Uh, based on need and money set aside, trade for DMs, uh, the district had two months uh, worth of benefits, uh, excuse me, two months worth, uh, two months budgeted for straight pay overtime, and this was based off of historical data throughout the district. Uh, board member Phil Selinger brought up an issue of a lot of garbage at First Avenue School, uh, garbage was piling up at the area. The district responded with, they're going to look into the matter and it's a possible issue with illegal dumping. Uh, we were also advised by 
our public and safety director, Mr. Eric Engel, that uh, our security working with no police to identify the persons who may be possibly dumping at our schools. Uh, Board member Marquisa Clue Lewis um, raised the issue that the grass needs to be cut and the lawns at schools need to be cut. As of 8 12 2015, all lawns and grass at all schools were to be cut. That was a directive given from the director of facilities. And if that had not happened, we report that issue to facilities immediately. We report it to myself and other informed facilities. Mr. Marquis Bill Lewis, board member, also raised the issue of the fence around New Clay High School. Uh, the question was, was the fence going back up? Uh, the issue response was that the fence might not go back up. Uh, as we were talking about the topic, the issue of trespassing uh, was, came up. Uh, I asked for Ms. Eagle to explain uh, trespassing and what the uh, statute is. It's a uh, fourth degree, it's a crime of the fourth degree. Um, and the requirements are the same as any other um, requirements for any other property. Uh, we move to public safety issues. Um, throughout the summer, there were no major incidents. Uh, there was one incident where the students were taken at Spencer uh, a week from our committee meeting. Uh, the number of computers were unknown, and the dollar amount of damage was unknown as well. We did ask for a list of burglaries and the dollar amount of the district. We were advised that that might be hard to get. And uh, this was also asked for buildings that are online and offline. Buildings that were closed uh, have been burglarized, and so what was the dollar amount for the damage that, uh, that occurred to those uh, buildings? We then talked about vacancies and security, and there were 19 vacancies. Um, and we also got into civil service. Uh, district is waiting for a uh, civil service list, and they will fill those vacancies off the civil service list. We also got uh, into the safety corridors conversation. Um, the district completed a map of uh, the safe travel passage for this school year, and that was then submitted to the North Police Department, and the district is now waiting for the no police department to approve or make recommendations to the travels, and then they will submit that back to the district. Uh, we were supposed to have a copy of the map um, by, I believe, this meeting or our next public meeting. If not, we will definitely have it at our next committee meeting. Board member Marquisa Quill Lewis asks Do we have a security shortage? Uh, our security director, Ingle, informed us that we are at a substantial number now. And we also got into a conversation on how personnel or security personnel are allowed into schools. Uh, Mr. Ingle told us there are several ways and strategies. One is the layout of the building, the age of students, and that's how permanent guards are assigned. And then there came a point where if there's an incident that arises at a school, uh, additional personnel might be assigned in the morning or evening for uh, dispatch to that school as needed. Um, some concerns around staffing may be solved with cameras, adding cameras. Um, and again, allowing personnel to dismiss and um, beginning of school and after school uh, times, just in case there are fights or incidents such as that. Uh, Mr. Phil Salinger, board member, asked the question that some schools have school aides sitting in the front, either with security or in the place of security guards, and they are actually signing people in to the school. And uh, assuming the role of security, asking why they need to sign those persons to the school. Uh, one school was mentioned, and that was a Hogan Street school. We 
we uh, we ask the district, can we uh, have a refresher course on the road, um, school aids, security guards, uh, personal aids, and that sort of thing, and uh, make sure that our front doors are staffed with security guard personnel. Uh, Mr. Phil Selinger, board member, also holds the question of permanent security guard and per diem security guards. Um, there was an issue stating that there were permanent guards that were laid off versus per diem guards that stayed with the district. We then got into the conversation of how we, the staffing levels of security guards, we have 10 month employees or security guards, we have 12 month employees with security guards, and we have per diems. Uh, board member Marquisa Quill Lewis also wrote issue of security guards being too young working in high schools. Uh, the notion was made that no guards under 21 were to work in the high schools. We then discussed the email that was sent out. Um, I myself, I didn't receive it until the day of the committee meeting. It was sent out by a community member uh, discussing the Broken glass in a classroom at Arts High School. It was a dance studio. Uh, I made sure that we added that agenda item to the agenda. Mr. Barton gave us an update uh, that the glass came in to replace the broken glass and the classroom was cleaned. And as of our committee meeting, the issue was resolved and the room was closed. The issue was there was a delay in ordering the glass, receiving the glass, and then sending it to the school. Uh, Mr. Barton said that they would work on uh, situations like that to have supplies shipped directly to the school instead of having it sent to the warehouse location and sent from the warehouse location to the school. Um, our next topic was ESIP. We actually have representatives tonight from our facility department and from the company called Tozo. Did I say that right? Tozo. Thank you. Here to uh, give us a presentation. Essentially, what's going to happen is, and they could probably be better to explain it to me, but from what I gathered, is that in April of 2015, the BPU Board of Public Utilities approved the $18.6 million energy saving plan for the district. Uh, and what will happen is we'll make capital project repairs uh, and, and in essence will save money um, after making repairs and making our district uh, better energy efficient. Thank you very much, Board Member Jackson. The floor is now open for discussion. Hi, right, Mr. Jackson, thank you for the report. Uh, I just have a few questions. Uh, first, do we know uh, do we know whether or not our schools will be 100% ready for the start of school? Board member, Mr. Ashan, uh, I was assured that uh, our school would be on target as far as cleaning for the first day of school. Uh, I don't know if I mentioned this in court earlier, but I was also advised that we have, um, we have additional tradesmen going to the school that need repairs. They, are working, they have enough money for overtime, and we also have per diem custodian staff going into the schools um, overtime as well, uh, cleaning our schools. So I was assured by our facilities department that we were going to target. Uh, also, on uh, RFP number uh, 8580, um, districts proposing to spend 200 and two thousand nine hundred twenty-four dollars on bridging and scaffolding at various schools throughout the district. Um, do we currently have pending emergent projects at these sites? And if we do, uh, if you could report back at a later time, you might not have it now. If you could just let us know what the status of those particular projects are, um, if they've been uh, in progress uh, since last school year, or these uh, new projects that have just uh, arisen and uh, are bringing these costs forward to us. And a, Mr. Rashawn. The last question I have is regarding uh, item 11.2, which is uh, the resolution for sustainable Jersey for school, 
for schools, I think it's obviously commendable that the district is uh, going down this path to uh, make the district more uh, green. Um, we've had these presentations as, as board members in our training, so I just want to know uh, how will the district engage students um, in that process? Because Sustainable Jersey, they, they kind of... Uh, uh, mentioned on, on numerous occasions that in other school districts throughout the state that they partner with the districts to um, bring in some type of curriculum in some instances and also teach students about STEM. Uh, and I just want to make sure that our students are being exposed to those opportunities as well. Uh, I was going to make a point on the uh, scaffolding, but I'll let you finish on the sustainable. Okay. Um, I will report that back to the committee, but I do want to also touch the scaffolding as well. Uh, we talked about that, uh, I believe, two committee meetings ago. Uh, we did have a conversation. Some of the scaffolding projects um, have been up for uh, quite some time in the district, and to my understanding, and correct me if I'm wrong, but some of the scaffolding has to be repaired that we actually have up in the district. In the plan. Quite some time. And these are projects that have been in the district for some time. <laughs> Madam Chair? Yes. Good evening, Madam Chair, board members, members of the community. Uh, Mr. Hassan, I wanted to provide a point of clarity that some of the projects where I think possibly all, if I'm not mistaken, are related to SDA projects. Is that correct, Mr. Barrett? So they are dependent as a former finance chair and former board chair, you know, they are dependent on the SDA's project schedule. So yes, some scaffolding has been up for a length of time, long enough to now be in disrepair, and the district has to incur the cost to replace that scaffolding to ensure safe environments. So that's why I asked the question, and I said emergent projects, because the SDA is responsible for the emergent projects, not the district. Mm -hmm. But... um. I think, you know, obviously Mr. Jackson brought up a, a good point, and you also, that we've had these projects in progress for quite some time. So I guess at this point, my, my question to Mr. Jackson and his committee is, is there anything that we can do collectively as a board to better support the district or better support your committee so that we can get uh, these projects completed or at least some more, some more progress on them because they're, they're costing us an enormous amount of money? Those funds can be redirected towards our classrooms, uh, to our students, and towards other critical resources that we need to sustain this district. Uh, agreed, Mr. Hassan. And I will uh, put that back to the committee um, and come back with an answer. Thank you, sir. Vice Chair Lewis, you no. had a question? Ms. Wilson said I was just going to touch on that a little bit because that's part of the Finance Committee, too. But Is there any other board members that have questions? Is there a motion to approve Mr. Jackson's report? Move. Second. second. Mr. Lewis. Uh, second by Mr. Hassan. All in favor. This is a motion Aye. to uh, approve the report, operations report by Mr. Jackson. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed or abstain? Motion carries. Next, next committee, we have program and instruction. Chaired by Ms. Antonette Basco-Richardson. Good evening, everyone. The Program and Instruction Committee uh, met on uh, August 13th. The meeting uh, was called to order at 5.39 p.m. The meeting lasted approximately two and a half hours, so I'm going to present a uh, summary rather than all the discussion that took place during that two and a half hour period. And rather than reading the agenda, I'm just going to actually go right into the agenda items for you. So the first, uh, we approved the, uh, the minutes from the June meeting, and our next order of business was a review of the field trip policy. There is a manual that is used to guide uh, how field trips are selected and all the processes that have to do with students on field trips in our district. So we, uh, over the summer, had actually reviewed that manual, and we came back to the table with uh, some projected uh, changes to that and uh, some of those changes have actually been 
been okayed by the district. We don't have a uh, uh, anything to show you at this point, but I'm just going to talk through what our conversations were. So after reviewing the current field trip procedures manual, the committee moved to revise some of the current policies by expanding the criteria for selecting field trips to include trips that encourage and aid in the development of physical fitness and social emotional growth because we know that physical fitness can directly, directly impact cognitive development and academic achievement. And we believe that allowing age appropriate recreational activities will benefit our students. So in saying that, basically that was uh, not allowed uh, in, in the manual that existed up to that point. So we moved to basically remove restrictions on field trips by the elimination of the following clauses from the field trip procedures manual. And, uh, Okay, the first one was all trips will be denied if the trips involve swimming, exposure to water, or water rides and activities. So the committee expressed that not only that access to water and safe recreational settings should not be prohibited, but uh, it was uh, expressed by Ms. Carter that the district should have an outlook, uh, a future outlook of including swimming in the curriculum. The committee did, however, call for two safety measures. One is a clear ban on the use of swimming pools in hotels on overnight field trips. This policy does already exist, but the committee has requested that a separate form, in addition to the regular trip permission form, be signed by parents and students acknowledging the prohibition on the use of swimming pools in hotels during overnight trips. And this is a preventative measure, particularly because hotels different from licensed recreational facilities do not have lifeguards on duty. On duty. We also recommended a ratio of uh, one adult for every seven students rather than one adult for every 10 students on field trips uh, where there are two recreational centers that have water <coughs> or water rides. So basically, um, and we had a, we we went through a lot of discussion about this. We also talked about our policy for parents attending uh, field trips, and, and I'm sorry for uh, parents or uh, basically parents or guardians. So at present, the policy is that uh, parents can only attend field trips if they are attending to their own children uh, for medical reasons. We uh, asked, we're asking for some advice uh, on legal on this because it was a consensus of the committee that this is probably not the way it's done in other communities and that it does, this policy uh, doesn't lend itself to good parental uh, and community participation. So those were two, uh, two of the major things that we discussed. But there was something else. I think I forgot to note it. Sorry, right, okay. Um, so, just to be very clear, what our, our intent was to remove the following three items from the, from the menu. All trips will be denied if the trip involves swimming, exposure to water, or water rides and activities. We wish to strike down. NPS will not approve field trips to amusement parks, motorized amusement rides, or arcades such as Six Flags, Lee Adventure, Joint Park, Hershey Park, Carousels, Fun Flex, etc. is the second item that uh, we need to say. And NPS will not approve field trips to restaurants, diners, bistros, cafes, medieval times, Applebee's, Arabian Nights, etc., etc., and food items cannot be purchased as part of the field trip. We basically feel that um, these experiences, when correctly planned and correctly supervised, are experiences that aid in the social and emotional development uh, of our students. Uh, so moving right along. And we are we are awaiting um, basically uh, feedback from the district on some of the aspects that are legal, but for the most part, uh, the district has agreed to the changes that we have proposed. So we will be getting that. Uh, within a short period of time, uh, hopefully within the 
in the next month with a revised document. Uh, next, we move to the projected resolutions for uh, this for this school year. Um, one uh, is the professional development for school leaders and teachers. Uh, for board members, that's item 8162, 81, and this is, I think, the old number system, 8189, uh, professional development in curriculum and other areas, and 8190, expanded learning time. So we had a lot of uh, questions on these items. Basically, the scope of work uh, that each vendor was doing, uh, whether they had done district, done business with the district, or what the projected costs are, and the, uh, whatever the proposal was that they gave to the district, and uh, how many students they would be servicing, and what the students, and what the services would be. So we actually just received most of that information this afternoon. So uh, we just, and our meeting was just on uh, Thursday. So we did receive the information today, but we have not had enough time to actually uh, look it over and to examine the answers to those questions. So the, qu the questions that we had, they were not really questioning anything uh, about the vendors that we thought was um, suspicious or not um, anything that we wouldn't want for the district. It was just simply that we didn't have the information that we thought that we would need to make uh, Make decisions. So, uh, you know, taking the time to read the information we got today, we will be better uh, able on next Tuesday. But at this point, there there are no voting items that we believe that we do not vote in favor of. We next uh, talked about the purchase of the ACT test as another uh, item, and uh, we talked about how the ACT test, uh, the timing of the test how it impacts on students, how it is used, how it will be used uh, as a possible alternative for students uh, in terms of the graduation requirement for testing. Uh, that it is not at this point being used within our district to place students uh, in classes. Uh, next we talked about cleaning and reconditioning of uh, athletic, fan, clothing, and equipment. That's, just, that's another reason contract. I don't remember if there was any particular uh, questions on that. And pending is uh, in athletics, a list of programs and games for the upcoming school year, and this will probably be deferred until September. Next item on the review of the current curriculum. Basically, we are not only as you know, good board members, but we are also obligated via QSAC, QSAC regulations, to approve new and, and approve our curriculum each year. So we are in the process of doing that. And Dr. Perkins has very graciously um, come up with a plan that we can use a workable plan where each month we will take the time to closely examine the area of curriculum and to then bring that to uh, the table to the board with a recommendation for passing that particular area of curriculum. And that will allow all the board members uh, the committee person and all the board members to really uh, be very clear on what our curriculum is, what books are being used uh, in, each, uh, in each area of study in the district. Uh, the, these curriculums will also be posted online and I'm not, um, and Dr. Perkins, you can correct me if I'm wrong, is we're not waiting until after they're all approved that these curriculums will Posted on online in a timely manner, and uh, the committee recommended that every document that's updated that the date of the update be included in the document. <coughs> and then we moved on to talk about QSAC results. So um, we didn't go a lot of into a lot of detail into QSAC because QSAC is actually going to be the subject of the superintendent's uh, report that's going to be given next Tuesday at the, at the regular board meeting. So we did look in particular at one area within program and instruction where we did lose points and uh, our question was, was it because of the IEP compliance, the, the 
individual education plan uh, compliance for uh, our special needs students. We we're all aware that we have uh, had an ongoing problem in terms of being in compliance. So um, what we are looking for is a formal detailed response from the county reviewers so that they can tell us exactly what was missing so that we as a board can be sure that we are following up with the district to make sure that when we have our six months we also talked a little bit about the district improvement plan that um, this is after we do by the superintendent for October 1st and we talked about the need for the time and stuff like that. And next item we move to uh, the Marion A. Bowling Student <coughs> Center. Um, for those who don't know, this center was opened in uh, 2008 and uh, we asked for an update on the programs other issues regarding the student center. So Sarah Cruz came in, she made a, a presentation on the student center. I'm gonna to have to really summarize it because this is a long discussion also. So uh, one thing, a uh, major issue that we talked about was uh, attendance. That um, Ms. Cruz said that the attendance is now up in the student center. And I know last year we actually um, asked to look at the attendance sheets because um, for a couple of years, uh, the attendance at the student center has been going down. So Ms. Cruz said that the attendance is up this year. We talked a lot about the busing because uh, there were initially six buses given to the district uh, from the Nicholson Foundation to be used for the student center. And uh, right now, I think she said there are four buses Use. But the purpose of the discussion was the fact that initially students would be picked up at their high schools and then taken to the student center from every high school in Newark. And then at the end of the evening, this is after school program, they would be brought back to their home, dropped off in front of their house. Now, last year, that was modified so that the students are no longer taken home and uh, they are dropped off at a school near their home or some uh, agreed upon North Public Schools building and the committee uh, was in agreement that we believe that they that bring students home to their home is a very important part of including keeping students at the student center and uh, ensuring their safety that that's why the program was developed that way in the first place. Uh, we talked about uh, funding, we talked about uh, how much the district was putting, I don't have these numbers in front of me, but how much the district was putting in uh, to the student center, that there's also uh, a grant from Victoria Foundation and another small grant. I don't remember where the other small grant was from. But, um, and then we talked about how that money was used. So initially when the student center opened, the funding had, the funding from uh, grants had to pay for food for the students because legally the district did not pay for, for food for students over 12 years old. That changed. So now um, the money from grants doesn't have to pay for food for the students, so it can all be used for programming. So we're very interested in what's going on uh, with the programming. And Ms. Cruz, uh, she's prepared a very detailed uh, chart for us showing us what all the programs are that will be going on at the student center this year. We had questions about uh, two programs in particular that had been dropped and uh, we wanted to know why. So one of those programs was a double dutch program which is an award winning, uh, nationally award winning double dutch program and uh, Ms. Cruz said that it was dropped because of the student participation but upon further investigation uh, she said that the program had only been in the student center for three months and our feeling was that three months is not time to give a program uh, to develop before dropping. And the other program that we asked about was the Mic It Up program. Uh, many people are familiar that the Mic It Up program was basically a three-year program uh, at the student center, especially before the student center, and um, was a is a performance uh, group and gave shows, I think, uh, at least once a month at the student center. 
and they are no longer at the student center. So that question was asked, but it seems uh, I'm not saying it was on purpose because there was you know, some very um, involved conversations going on, but she did leave without asking, without answering that particular question. Okay, so I'm sorry, it was, yeah, in, in terms of the grants for the student center, in addition to what the district pays, there's a $10,000 grant for STEM programming from PSENG and a $60,000 uh, grant from the Victoria Foundation. And the district uh, puts in approximately $340,000. And what I didn't ask, I'm not sure, um, Ms. Wilson, you might know, does that cover uh, the operations you know what that three hundred forty thousand oh, no. Okay, so that that would be a question that I'm yeah. Yes, sir. Absolutely. And um, we also have questions about um, whether there was student input into choosing the programs that are going on now, um, and uh, what's going on with the television, uh, with the television studio, which we said that there's uh, upgrades being done now to the television studio. And I'm going to um, move on to the next uh, to the next topic, which is a summer school update. We do not have uh, final numbers. However, um, we were told that um, the, uh, of a wait list of 605 students, 599 of those students were enrolled after being on the wait list. We had questions uh, earlier, I think, in May and June about the wait list. So the vast majority of those students were placed and we are awaiting, uh, awaiting final data. In summer school, which I believe Dr. Perkins said we have in September, is that correct? It's either September or October, that's it, pending the input from the board. Okay. Um, next item was special education, and uh, we will, in September, be sharing updated lawsuit information as part of our report. The last topic, the last topic uh, was the football camp. So there was discussion about the fact that uh, in the past that our football players were trained at a particular camp and that they would not be going there this year. That the uh, training for the football players would be uh, basically uh, in-house this year and for this year only. And uh, we had a lot of questioning about that. And the information from Dr. Perkins was that given the uh, inability to reach a uh, contract or an agreement with the camp that it was the consensus or it was the opinion of the actual football coaches to do the training uh, in-house this year. And that ends, that ends my report. Thank you very much, Ms. Baskerville Richardson. The floor is now open for discussion. Does any board member have any questions? No questions? Is there a motion to approve Ms. Baskerville? Motion. Second? That was Second. Ms. Carter. <laughs> Mr. Jackson, motion to approve the uh, operation, I'm sorry, the uh, program instruction committee report as given by Ms. Baskerville, moved by Ms. Carter, and second by Mr. Jackson. All in favor? Aye. Any opposed or abstain? Motion carries. Report approved. <laughs> Thank you very much. Up next, we have Ms. Dashay Carter for personnel and policy committee. Good evening, everyone. Um, our meeting date was August 11th, 2015. Those who attended, uh, board members were Ariana Perillo, Donald Jackson, myself, NPS members Vanessa Rodriguez, Kimberly Casanov, Larissa, Andrea, and Elizabeth. Uh, the committee meeting started at 5.35. We went over the vacancy report. So there are 124 vacancies across the district um, for teachers and two VP vacancies. I received the list, so I broke them down by school so you all can have a feel of what the vacancies are per school. So there's one at Bard High School, seven at Baron Steam, four at Newark Leadership Academy, one at Fast Track, four at University, one at Science, two at Arts High, nine at Baron Arts and Humanities, six at Central High School, 12 at Eastside, five at Shabazz, four at Weekway, two at Technology, six at Early Childhood, three at Eagle Academy, five at Newark Vocational, seven at Girls Academy, five at American History, six at Early College High, three at Abington Ave, 
five at Ann Street, seven at Park Elementary, one at Avon, one at Belmont Runyon, 11 at Luis Munoz Moran, four at Camden, three at Chancellor, seven at Cleveland, five at Elliott, four at First Ave, three at Franklin, 16 at William Horton, five at E, I'm a flag, eight at Hawkins, seven at Hawthorne, six at Lafayette, one at Lincoln, eight at McKinley, nine at Miller, three at Mount Vernon, three at Oliver Street, 10 at Peshine, four at Quitman, one at Ridge Street, one at South Street, one at Rafael Hernandez, no, I apologize, six there, one at South 17th Street, two at Harriet Tubman, six at Speedway, three at Roberto Clemente, three at Early Childhood School West, three at Sussex, seven at Early Childhood at Bel yeah, th seven at Early Childhood Center, six at Wilson Avenue, six at Ivy Hill, five at Spencer, 13 at 13th Avenue, 13 at Carver, and eight at the Early Childhood Center at Annex. Um, <clears throat> The principals are currently interviewing candidates daily to fill these roles, so this report is as of today. Um, principals have just gotten off of vacation, so I was told that they would be working throughout the month of August to get these spots filled. We then went over the separation uh, report. There were 65 resignations, 23 retirements, um, 109 total, 24 non-renewal, 15 elimination of positions or reorganization, 63 layoffs and seven discharges. There were 79 uh, civil service layoff titles um, that took place. The staffing updates, we talked about the layoffs, as I said. Um, we talked about the positions that were affected. I'll go over those as well. There were two accountant positions, three administrative secretaries, five clerk ones, one community relations specialist, one data entry machine operator, one early childhood specialist, seven keyboard clerk ones, one keyboarding clerk one bilingual, 13 keyboarding clerk twos, two keyboarding clerk threes, one management assistant, two management specialists, one sec two secretarial assistants, uh, one senior, three senior accountants, one senior data control clerk, one statistical typist, one supervisor telephone system, 23 teacher aides, seven technical assistant, technical assistant three, and one technician MIS. NPS confirmed that all employees impacted in the civil service layoff who were enrolled in the new PATHS program will receive $37,000 in total rewards in tuition and living subsidies in order to pursue an associate's or bachelor's degree or a certification program. The board members requested a list of all titles that were impacted in the reduction in force, a list of vacancies of nine teachers at the school-wide level, and an updated vacancy report, which we did receive this morning, which is the numbers I just gave you. The committee also discussed new hires. The committee discussed critical new hires within the district. Science Park High School, the committee discussed that the current principal is an interim principal, which was recommended by the community. I brought up along with uh, my board member, Donald Jackson, that we were told that the selection of the principal at Malcolm X Shabazz, there was no community input. Um, I had heard from some members in the community that they weren't happy and that they had a put input with the selection of the last principal. We were told that there was input, input was requested and received through the Alumni Association. Uh, the board members also talked about the list of, we wanted to know the list of critical hires within the central office. We wanted a new hire report with the title and placement, and we wanted a biography for the current principal of Malcolm X Shabazz High School, and we wanted to know who was involved with that. We also talked about the EWPS matching. The committee discussed the placement process put in place to match the EWPS teachers to the current vacancies within the district. We requested a breakdown of employees who are currently in the EWPS pool. We also asked were there any teachers force placed, and we were told no. Um, we also were, uh, we asked about 
why there were certain teachers who were placed in one turn, who were already a teacher in a turnaround school and they were placed in another turnaround school. What sense did that make? Um, and they said that was a part of the contract, which they provided us with the contract from NTU. So we discussed the uh, contract. Uh, Ms. Rodriguez has agreed to invite the Director of Labor Relations to the September committee meeting to brief the board members on the new ratifications of the contract. We requested a copy of the NCU contract, which we received a few days ago. Um, so all board members should have that if you want to look over it and the language of what it says. Um, we discussed, the committee discussed the district's effort of promoting talent within a district, promoting within, and that's what was said, that promotion happened within. The only one who was hired outside of the district was the principal for Malcolm X Shabazz. We also talked about the New Jersey CUSAC. The committee discussed the recent scores, which we were scored at a 60%. Um, we said that we wanted to be a part of developing a plan, so myself, I will talk along with Ms. Rodriguez to schedule a time outside of our board meeting, outside of our traditional committee meeting, so that we can have a, a meeting just around how we can uh, strategize to improve our QSAC score. The board members also requested a list of each school, each district school with the current administration and the team members that are in that school. There's one thing on the minutes that I'm not sure about. It says the restorative practices um, I don't recall speaking about that. So if you can speak on to what that says on this report. Yeah, uh, the question was posed in place of the guidance counselor positions a few years ago that were the title um, of attendance counselors. What was done with the attendance counselor role? And in that process, what we discussed is that there was a movement around restorative practices. And so in that, we have multiple positions at the school level, including guidance counselors, who play a significant role around attendance as well as teachers. And um, that was part of the conversation. I said that probably get more detail around that specific role and the work around restorative practices at a different uh, committee meeting. And I'm sure any of the assistant superintendents can speak to the work that's happening in schools around that as well. OK. And our meeting um, adjourned at 630. Thank you very much, Ms. Carter. The floor is now open for discussion. Ms. Basco Richardson. Yes, Ms. Carter said that Ms. Rodriguez said that there was no forced placement. Yes. Okay, so uh, I'd like to ask the question. I guess that's what I was going to There's no forced placement, then could you please explain um, what is, how are the teachers being placed, the ones who, um, the turnaround schools who didn't sign off to, um, you know, to do the um, additional uh, time as well as um, yeah. what is the fate of, um, we still have a lot of teachers who are uh, cool. So if there's no force placement, then what's happening with those so So we don't, we, so here's the process. In terms of teachers who, um, do not sign the EWA, they automatically, and they, this has been, been communicated since the early spring, that they would automatically go into the EWPS pool, during which we would open up opportunities for transfer periods and mutual match. So each teacher has the opportunity, if they're choosing not to sign the EWA, to interview with other principals at other schools. If, for whatever reason, they don't solidify a match then we work closely with the assistant superintendents and principals to match teachers to positions based on their certification and content area. We don't refer to that as a forced placement because it is a conversation and dialogue with principals where they're saying, yes, I have this vacancy, I know this teacher, I want this teacher. And then mm -hmm. the teacher's place. The teacher at every opportunity is given um, you know, access to fit finding a mutual match prior to our placement process with ASUPS and principals. So we don't refer to that as forced placement because there's opportunity throughout the entire um, process for them to find a match. And more often than not, what happens is the teacher chooses not to do that. And as so, they're choosing then to allow us to match them to a school. 
I also want to bring up when I mentioned that point, it was also said that they were not allowed to stay at the school because my question was, if there's a spot at Carver and you're at Carver or if there's a spot at Hawthorne and you're at Hawthorne, why not stay there if you're an effective teacher? Um, so they weren't allowed that option either to stay somewhere, move to other turn turnaround schools. So at what, point, at what point is this matching process now, meaning specifically how many teachers in either uh, from the turnaround schools and how many teachers from the, uh, from the current um, pool have not been placed? So what number are we looking at not placed? So currently, we're looking at 120 individuals in the EWPS pool. And we're still going through the process of matching um, teachers and educators to vacancies. So we have been doing that process all summer, working collaboratively with the principals and the networks to ensure that they are placed and matched based on their content and subject area. And we're still continuing to do that process. So there, that is as of today. But we know that in the next week, we're also going to make more matches. So those numbers start to fluctuate. We also know that as people retire or resign, which some individuals wait and notify us right as school is beginning, we start to see other vacancies come up, which allows us to then make more matches between teachers in the EWPS pool and our vacancy. We may have teachers who are in our EWPS pool who may not match up with the vacancy because of either their certification or the content area of the vacancy. So what is the logic then of not placing uh, teachers who need a certification into a turnaround school? Um, I mean, just into a vacancy? Yeah, I mean, it's so it may be. So mm -hmm. I'm, I'm yeah, some some of the individuals who are still in the pool, um, it may be because they don't match up by certification or subject area. It may be that they're currently on workers comp; they're just not here. They're on a leave. It also may be that they're they were rated ineffective for two years in a row and will be served with tenure charges. So there's lots of different reasons why people may still be in the EWPS pool. But what I was asking is, what is the harm in placing a teacher uh, who, um, from a turnaround school, who you took out and put in the EWPS pool? What is the harm to the children in the district of placing those those teachers into a slot where they are certified? Because it we, we, sounds, it feels mm -hmm. very punitive, and it doesn't it feel is. like it is a decision that is made. In the interest so, of children. So, so to be clear, we. Like an answer. Yeah, no, to be clear, the, the folks who are left in the, the. So, in other words, we've already placed those teachers. Those teachers are all in classrooms. The people who are left in the pool are left in the pool for the reasons I just articulated. So, I'm Thank sorry you. if that was not clear. All of those teachers who did not sign the EWA and were rated highly effective, effective, even partially effective, were placed into positions. Okay. I have another to bring up. I know during a meeting we discussed the principal at Hawthorne um, that's missing in the minutes, so I would like that to be added. But I would also like to know an update um, because I've been hearing different things, so if we can have an update on the principal at Hawthorne. Well, with all due respect, we can't discuss individual personnel matters. I'm not what asking for individual personnel matters. I'm just asking the, generally what is the update with Hawthorne. For, with, with the title of principal. Yes, I was okay. told that there was a principal placed everywhere. And so what I'm saying is that's missing out of the minutes. And so I would like that. Yes, uh, Henry Grady is the principal of Hawthorne, and he is at Hawthorne this year. Thank you. Can we add that to the minutes, um, our discussion of? Yes, we can. Thank you. I think the question was posed at a different meeting, and so that's why it wasn't in this one. OK. But we will, we will add that. OK. Mr. Chair Lewis, Mr. Lewis. What, I don't know if I missed this, but um, where, as far as principal, I mean teachers, did we hire any new teachers this year? Yes. So why? We, we hire, so when we do hire new teachers, it's mostly around hard to staff. 
subject and content areas. In other words, we don't currently have enough teachers in NPS that can fill those vacancies. So we have uh, less available teachers in our NPS staff around science, math, and bilingual. So we're always at um, a place where we're we have fewer available teachers for those subject and content areas than we have vacancies. So, so we're always looking to staff in those areas and we're always hiring around those specific three areas. So my, my question is this, um, if we have individuals in the EWP pool who once upon a time was inside a classroom um, and is certified by the state to teach, why are we hiring folks before we giving these individuals uh, first priority so that we can lower the number of folks in our EW people. Yeah, that's a great question. The que because they're not certified. The, if they're in the EWPS pool and they don't have the certification in math or science or bilingual, then they can't fill those vacancies. And that's part of the reason many of the teachers who are left in our EWPS pool are there for um, a number of reasons, one including that they do not currently match a vacancy. So, so their certification, we have excess teachers for the number of vacancies we have. So for example, if we have 10 math vacancies but only two math teachers in the EWPS pool, then we can only match those two to the two of the 10 vacancies, which would then leave us still with eight vacancies that we need to fill. And to ensure that we fill those vacancies and start school with as many of our vacancies filled, we would have to hire externally to ensure we have enough teachers in those placements. So, so my question is this. We're paying for professional development, right? Um, and our job is to, we try to lower our costs of, of um, as much as possible. EW people should be one of the main things we should be focused on because it's costing us a lot of money to pay folks um, who's really not doing nothing. Um, and we have professional development. And each month, the district come to this board and asks us to vote on contracts for professional development. So if these folks are not certified or need some type of development in certain areas to put them back in the classroom, shouldn't that be our focus uh, when we talk about spending money in this district? Yeah, we do provide every teacher, including teachers in the EWPS pool, with professional development. And it is, you know, their certification, that's something that they would need to want to do. If they want to expand their certifications and add a math certification, we are all for it because we have a huge need for math teachers, bilingual teachers, and science teachers. So we are happy to support teachers who want to go for their certification in those areas, but we can't place a teacher that isn't certified in those areas into those positions until they've completed the certification process in that subject or content area. So in, in order to ensure that we have teachers and vacancies filled for the beginning of the school year, we are put in a position where we have to recruit externally for teachers. And we have good partnerships with Rutgers, Montclair State University, Seton Hall, you know, other universities where we look to have them support us in identifying strong math, science, and bilingual teachers who can fill those vacancies throughout our schools. So I, I completely agree with you. Um, I have, so, go ahead. You can go. Ms. No, Mr. Jackson. Oh. I'll, I'll let Ms. Fonseca go first because I'm kind of going to switch to the question. Ms. Fonseca. Thank you. Um, so we were talking about the professional development and all. So do we know with timing in advance, like, because if we have time to interview people and have new people come on board, do we have enough time to let the other teachers know that don't have placement? Like, do we give them enough time to become certified? Because I feel like we should give them enough time so that we can fill that in-house rather than you know having to go outside again when we have people not doing anything. So we are consistently throughout the school year talking and communicating with our ED any teacher in the EWPS pool, so that's one. Second, if teachers want to become certified, it's a broader process. I think it's more than just a year. They have to get the right credits 
And I think that we've communicated that we have great need in the area of math, uh, science, and bilingual. So that is something we've communicated consistently around our recruitment and when there are um, vacancies and talent match and transfer periods and opportunities for interviewing and mutual match, we communicate that there's an urgent need around these areas. So if, if you have a dual certification, we consistently ask the teachers who have, let's say, elementary certification as well as a math certification, if they would be willing to teach in their math certification, because that is such a huge need. So we do provide that opportunity. At the end of the day, it will be upon the teacher if they choose to get the certification. And how are we communicating that information to them? Are we just hitting them with an email every, you know, so often? Or are we actually doing the, you know, the outreach to those individuals so that they are, you know, aware of it? We do do email is one way, but we do call a lot of our teachers in the EWPS pool to try to have one on one conversations. We also send surveys to them, which they complete about what they um, feel they, they're, they're best qualified to teach based on their certifications. And we work closely with the principals who work with them in the schools, because all EWPS teachers are in schools. So they're in schools as additional support, and they do teach because they have to be observed in order to receive an annual rating. So our principals work closely with these teachers, and many of these teachers, they've hired into budgeted positions once they've had a vacancy that matches their content or subject area. And the EWPS pool has, specifically this year, I think, decreased significantly in the number of teachers that we have in that pool. So we do work very closely with them at different levels and in different ways. Okay, so my last question, and I'm sorry to no, bombard okay. you. Um, how many teachers did we hire for this school year? Do you know, external. have an idea? Yeah, external. external. It's very few. I don't know the number of hand, but we can get that for you. Okay, thank you very much. With that, can we also have the resumes of those who were hired um, district-wide? External, external teachers' resumes? District-wise, not just teachers, within a central office as well. You want resumes of every single new hire? Yes. And their national origin. I, I, uh, I don't know if we're allowed to provide Miss uh, Carter, yes. you're looking for resumes of all new hires from what period? Let's say March. March, which is the last fiscal year? Yes. Okay. So from March to? Currently. OK. Um, can I ask that you give us some time? That will not be available for next week's board meeting. But That's give fine. us some time to gather that data for you. That's fine. And I think there's some. Also, I just need to qualify that uh, pursuant to the OPRA law, we do have to redact whatever might be personal information on there. So once we pull the resumes, my office will go through it. So that'll be a, an extra, a little shorter time, longer time for this to review. Uh, but we'll work as quickly as we can to get that to you. Okay. And in addition to that, I know the board, we requested, um, which I read in a minute, um, a breakdown of who's in an EWPS pool. We would like that breakdown by content area, years of teaching, race, gender, um, and how long they've been in the EWPS pool, as well as can we get a date in which we can get this report? So some of that information we don't collect and won't have readily available for you. So yeah. we can we can go through what we we can go through what we do collect through the application process and what we do have, and that we can provide to you for whoever is currently in the EWPS pool. But I also want to stress that that number consistently keeps changing. We're still working to place as many of those teachers as possible. So our hope is that there'll be fewer um, before the first day of school in the actual pool, fewer t fewer teachers. So we can collect it for who we have, okay. um, but we won't be able to collect all the details that you're requesting because we just don't collect that information. When will we be able to get that report? It depends, it, it depends on um, what information we have and how long it takes to collect. I can't give you a timeline at this moment. Can I ask that since we are in the process of placing EWPS, that uh, staff and depleting that pool, that we give you that information as of August 30th, which is just about when we're ready to open schools. 
because otherwise you get a snapshot at this moment in time and it's going to change because, but at that point we anticipate that we will have processed all the people that we can possibly hire and have placed them, and then you get a true picture of what the EWPS pool is going to look like. So I would like that report, but in addition to that, can we also have a report of those who have been in the EWPS pool from its inception? So we can just get a background of who's been in the pool. Yes. Yes. Are you asking for who's been in the pool? The, are you asking, just to, be, to understand the request, is it of the people who are currently in the pool, how no, I would like many, to know. Or everybody who's been in the pool over the last four years. That as well. Was, we may not still have access to that information because once we place someone into a budgeted position, they're out of the pool. Okay, so there's two reports that I would like. To see. Okay. I have to check to see if we can actually still pull that because in the system, they move from EWPS, right, which is really a budgeted line at central office to a budgeted position of school. So they're no longer considered EWPS. So that movement. So we don't keep track of who has been in the EWPS pool, yeah. period, meaning that I was once in the EWPS pool, but now I'm in a budgeted position. There still should be record. Budget and see if we can pull that, but I'm. We'll have time. to look at that in terms of the employee's record and stuff. So okay. if you're talking four years worth of data, that's going to take a little bit of time. Can I also ask that you submit that quest, those requests in writing so okay. that we have clarity on exactly what you're looking for? And please put uh, periods of time that you may be looking at. Thank you. Ms. Pascoe Richardson? Yes. Uh, Ms. Carter, I would like to respectfully add to that request uh, that we uh, receive the reason that each person was in the EWPS pool. Of course, not any detail of if there's anything you know, that came out, but just a general category of why the person is in the Any other board members? Yes. Mr. Jackson? Uh, through the chair of the personnel committee, which I also sit on, um, this is going to actually change gears a little bit. In the office talent and the office personnel conduct a impact study on the elimination of the position of the department chair. The reason why I brought that up is because this year, um, if I'm not mistaken, marks three years uh, since the title was eliminated, so to speak. And those persons who were serving in the department chairs were respectfully then changed into vice principals. And we have schools with population less than 700, but there are over six vice principals and a principal. Um, at the time, I believe the excuse or the reason was that the district was in financial hardship or whatever have you. And district's financial state hasn't really changed much since then. And with that being said, did that move save the district money or did it cost the district money? And since those people are now able to be tenured because they served in that position for quite some time, um, I wanted to know from the committee respectfully if we can investigate the impact of that move. So if I may, uh, Mr. Jackson, um, we'll provide any and all information that we are uh, allowed to by law without question. What would be most helpful to us is if you could articulate in writing the exact questions that you've, many of them you've referenced right now in your explanation, rather than use the word study, if you would really give us a list of the questions, because that will narrow our scope as to how we look at this, and also to be able to provide, provide definitive answers to you, rather than in a macro level. Okay. Also, uh, Ms. Luke from my office, which you're familiar with, can be very, um, she'll be very helpful in also helping to identify um, how to word the question so we can, in fact, go right in, excise the proper information for you, and do it as expositiously as possible. Okay? Thank you. And let me add, since we now have a board relations office, can I ask that uh, you send your questions to your board chair? and copy the Board Relations Office so that we can track and ensure that you get the responses and responses are received in a timely fashion. 
Thank you. Um, Ms. Rodriguez, um, I have a question, and this just came up after our meeting. After the meeting, I was approached by a couple of teachers that um, are unhappy with their placement of school. I do believe in the importance of consistency and being happy where you're being placed. Um, some teachers, they're not happy with the, the school that, that they're currently in. Now, my question is, because I know the importance, the importance of consistency and how um, it affects a, a school culture, a school climate, or, or the actual school and make it a more inviting and friendly school and everyone is expected to know what to do, because instead of actually um, the actual school and the administrator feel welcome um, with the school that they're in, I feel that it will weaken the school instead of actually strengthening the school. Therefore, my question is, do you feel that a school with a new um, administration, a new leadership, a new staff will strengthen the school culture or weaken it? Madam Chair, with all due respect, uh, Ms. Rodriguez, um, I mean, th that's an opinion, a personal opinion. If there's a specific question that you want to ask, we will uh, most definitely answer it empirically with data. Um, but that is a personal opinion that you're asking Ms. Rodriguez to advance. Madam Chair. Yes, Ms. Lewis. Uh, uh, Madam Council, uh, I think uh, her title, uh, professionalism as the chief talent officer, could warrant her to answer that question because as a chief talent officer, you should know what's the best practices uh, for a building if you are the one in charge of staff in the building. With, with, with all due respect, um, Vice Chair Lewis, um, I'm not disputing the expertise that um, comes with the title of Chief Talent Officer. What I'm asserting is that if there's a pointed question based upon data and upon empirical information the district has, that's within the purview of what the Chief Talent Officer can answer. What, we're, what you're asking, in, with all due respect, we can agree to disagree here, is a personal opinion. So if there are questions specifically based on statistics and data, we'll be more than happy to share that with you as we have tried to um, during the entire course of this meeting. I have, uh, Madam Chair, yes, I have so questions. Fun. So, um, to that point, I think. Uh, my question will be uh, based off of the district's policies and past practices um, for turnaround of a new schools in, within this district. Have those policies and past practices yielded the expected results that the district has projected over the last three years? Anybody can answer. That's a question that we can answer. I don't know if we have the information today, but clearly uh, it might require uh, a look back at, at the data to give you a complete information and answer to that. All right. no, my next question is, um, <laughs> the next question I have is in regards to uh, the EWPS pool. We've had a, we've had a lot of uh, discussion about it tonight. Um, but one thing we didn't, we didn't talk uh, here is the anticipated cost um, for the 2015-2016 school year for the EWPS pool. Um, as a board, we've had some discussion with the uh, new superintendent as well regarding this matter. And there has been some, obviously, some uh, changes that have been made uh, to the budget and the district strategy to reduce the, uh, the, the gap that we currently have. Um, but we haven't really received any, any data or any numbers or projections with regards to the EWPS pool. So that is agreed. And when, at a point in time when the pool becomes, is less dynamic, let me, let me say this, a, at a time when the pool is less dynamic, which we just talked about with Ms. Carter, let's say August 30th, which is a point where we should be fully staffed in schools, if we are going to properly and successfully open schools, at that point, the individuals in the pool 
will be clearly identifiable, and therefore the cost associated with them should also be clearly identifiable. Okay. Uh, um, Mr. Hassan, any more yeah, questions? I have one more question. Um, I don't know if you want to call for order, but I do have another question. Uh, the question is in regards to professional development. Uh, we talked about that a lot, and uh, I would like to know uh, through the chair of our personnel uh, committee uh, if we could be provided with the, the number, uh, the amount of professional development uh, hours and hours uh, that has been uh, provided to uh, our teachers who are in the EWPS pool who have had a rating of partially effective or ineffective over the last two years. One. Once again, I will ask that these questions be submitted in writing so that there is clarity, right? And our process is gonna be that questions be submitted to the board chair, copy the board relations office so that we can ensure that we are tracking them and ensuring that answers come back and items are closed for the Thank board. You. Thank you. Ms. Carter? I was just gonna ask that you also copy me so that I can make sure in our next meeting it's addressed. I'll send them straight to you. Um, I stand corrected. The appropriate committee chair should be copied. Thank you, Ms. Carter. Any more questions? Because we are in the, the personnel committee and we have new faces in the back of our board members, I would like each individual to introduce himself along with their title. Starting with? I will introduce. We have Hakisha Taylor, raise your hand, Ms. Taylor, who is a special assistant in the area of facilities. Ms. Taylor has been with us two years, two and a half years, one and a half. Uh, we have, they don't have microphones. We have Elizabeth Gelber who is a uh, deputy chief of staff in the area of talent and has been providing board support, support on SSOT. Ms. Gelber, how long have, how long have you been here? Since February. Uh, who else is new? I think those are the only new ones. The lady, uh, the, yellow. the lady at the end in the glasses is actually, in fact, our labor relations director, uh, Lorette Asante Esquire. Ms. Asante, how long have you been with the district? Almost 10. Yeah. director. Yes, she is. Esquire. Thank you very much, Ms. Wilson. Um, Nobody made a motion yet. Is there a motion to approve Ms. Carter's um, report? Move. Mr. Lewis. <coughs> Second by Mr. Salinger. This is a motion to approve the personnel committee report as delivered by Ms. Carter. Moved by Mr. Lewis. Second by Ms. Salinger. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed or abstain? Motion carries. Report approved. Next we have our Vice Chair Lewis, which is the chair for Finance Committee. Good evening. Good evening. Our Finance Committee st uh, meeting started yesterday. Uh, at 6 or 7 p.m., the committee was informed mm -hmm. that the district had decided to accept the board's correction action plan for the Tiffany Hardrick audit, uh, which consists of the board asking general counsel to request the entire total payment of $12,115.05 to be returned to the district. Also, in, in that um, corrective action plan, the board have asked for the dismissal of Vanessa Rodriguez, chief talent officer, to the district, and also asked for the general counsel to ask for a legal criminal investigation uh, in this matter. Due to, this, uh, due to the new superintendent coming, our budget is still being worked on uh, that was, that's what was told to me by the BA. This is still work in progress. Um, the scaffolding, we talked um, through the operations committee, but also came up in the finance committee. Just, just a little brief to let you know, there's six scaffolds uh, in the district, Burnett Street School, 
It's the district website, I mean, the district warehouse, Maple Avenue School, Shabazz High School, Warren Street School, and North Vocational. In our, on, in our uh, operations committee, me and the, also the finance committee, we was informed that there's two courses that's associated to this. There's a first-time course to set up the scaffolds, and then there's a yearly course for each scaffold. We also discussed the resolution of the health benefits, uh, which is about $117 million. Board members was uh, had concerns about RS, was there an RFP advertised for the bid of this, and if so, when? Madam BA informed us that there was no bid due to state statute. We don't do the state statute or RSP don't have to be put out, even though the district planned to do so. The district is also proposing uh, to ask from the ask for three point five million dollars to cover to cover our funds, our costs, such a deal that we couldn't cover, such as our uh, from our balance fund, which is to cover our charter school payments, employment without placement, and unfound positions. Questions that was asked about this was what is an unfunded position? Um, I also, as also asked through email, uh, what, what, the, what, how much, how much are we saving by the recent layoffs, and how is it affecting the district, the departments, and which layoffs occurred? The board also, I mean, the committee also talked about the. Energy savings plan. We talked about the schools that will be implemented in phase one. Will be in Arts High School. Oh, excuse me. Phase one of the phase one will be in six of our schools: Arts High School, Barringer High School, George Washington Carver, Malcolm X Shabazz, Technology High School, and Weekway High School. Some of the questions that I refer back to Madam BA for further discussion was to ask how much are we cutting from our school's budget? How much, I said that how much, uh, what is the cost of all consultants up to date? Are there any non-budget payments? How much cuts are we, are, how much cuts will our athletic department incur? Uh, how much, uh, where is the title money, title one money being used for? This meeting was adjourned at 7.45 yesterday p.m. Yes, yes please. Vice Chair Lewis, I just needed to make one clarification, if I may. I was not able to attend uh, the Finance Committee meeting. With respect to the cap pursuant to the OFAC report uh, regarding uh, former Assistant Superintendent Tiffany Hardrick, um, the district, as the board is aware, did submit a cap to which the uh, board did not um, approve of that cap. Subsequent to that, the board has submitted a revised cap that had different uh, qualifying information. I have been in touch with um, the OFAC uh, committee as well as with the commissioner's office because upon information and belief, which has been confirmed by the commissioner's office, the district has never been in a position prior to this whereby we cannot fulfill the statute. The statute obligates the uh, board to submit, meaning the, the district, to submit a cap that's been approved by the SAB. Um, by the school board, pardon me. And uh, with respect to the fact that we have differing opinions on this, which I do understand uh, there is no meeting of the minds, I needed to seek guidance because we have a statutory requirement to submit this to the OFAC uh, committee, as well as uh, the board is aware to post this on our website. The advice that I was given, and I was not given this advice prior to the finance committee meeting to give this to Ms. Wilson, is that um, I've been advised to submit the cap that the district has prepared 
along with the cap that the, um, the board has prepared, which differs from our cap that the district submitted about two months ago. Uh, this will be both given to the OFAC committee and they will uh, render and address uh, both caps and give, uh, give some type of uh, guidance further to the district. Um, barring the fact that I understand that there is no ability for us to agree upon one cap, whereas in prior instances, we have always been able to at least modify fire compromise. Uh, there's no position here, I think, that will actually um, be able to meet that particular spirit of the statute. So I just wanted to inform you that the district does not um, agree to the cap that is submitted by the board, um, but we are submitting both caps. And again, that's upon my uh, request for guidance as to how to fulfill the statute requirements. And that's the position that the district will uh, submit and take to the, um, to the OFAC committee. I have a question. Ms. Carter. Um, may you, Marquise, repeat uh, the contract you were speaking of? What contract when you said that they didn't have to go out? I wasn't clear on that, that part. That was the uh, health benefits. And so can you repeat, you said that the district said that we don't have to go out to bid for that? Due to the state statute, they don't have to go out to bid. So it's my understanding that you do have to go out to bid. It's not to, the term of the contract can exceed five years. So if council could. I'm gonna take that one. Ms. Carter, pursuant to 18A, 18A, 5A-10. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, the statute indicates that insurance coverage or consultants associated with insurance are not required to be publicly bid. They are, um, that's just what the statute actually reads, and I don't know if anybody has their statute book. I didn't bring mine. From so that, that it is not subject to the public bidding laws. It is an exception based on that statute. Now, what Mr. Lewis also indicated in his report, that is, that item is on the agenda this evening, and the district does intend to go out to bid because it is good practice. We are not required to do so, but it is good practice every several years to look at the marketplace and based on our size and based on our activity, thank you, Council, based on our size and based on our activity, we uh, would want to look for pricing. So let me read the statute into the record. And it is 18A. 18A 510, insurance, including the purchase of insurance coverage and consultant services, which exception shall be in accordance with the requirements for extraordinary unspecifiable services. And if you look up extraordinary, we are not saying, I want to be very clear, that this is an extraordinary and unspecifiable service, but based on the way it is written in the statute, and if you look under unspecified services, you will see that it is not subject to public bidding. Okay, I was asking it based off the local public contract law, mm -hmm. um, which I was looking at 40A-11-4.2, mm -hmm. where it says, unless an exception is provided for under section 15 of PL 1971C198, permitting a longer contract duration, contracts awarded pursuant to section five of PL 1999C440, may be a term not to exceed five years. Um, and then it further goes on in 40A-11 through 15, um, that insurance, including the purchase of insurance coverage, insurance consulting, or administrative services claims, administrative services including participation in a joint self-insurance fund risk management, um, is not to exceed the term of not more than three years. And so if it hasn't gone out to bid, shouldn't it be? Ms. Carter, the statute that governs school districts is 18A for ed education. Okay. So that trumps the statute that you're referring to. Okay. I have a question or a comment. Uh, let me just make um, a question regarding the same topic. Actually, the same resolution, which is for all board members, the resolution is 8619 health benefits. 
Um, whereas I have a couple of questions. Um, I do understand that um, we have not gone out to bid for a couple of years, and we are going to, to do so, I believe, is for by next year. But item number E, which is brokerage concepts, which states at no cost to exceed $2.7 million, and item number F, supplemental fringe benefits, at cost not to exceed 19.2 and then has you know a lot of numbers, and then 117. Um, I am unsure what what the numbers are for for 17 for line number F, but I also want to know who um, is Brokerage Concept. What do what, they, what do they do? What services have they provided to the district for us to pay them 2.7 million dollars? All right, so let's talk about that. Brokerage Concepts is a third-party administrator which services Local 3, which is the Food Services Union, and Local 617 as required by their collective bargaining agreements. Brokerage Concepts currently manages temporary disability, prescription for GPP, and vision for their members, the unions that I mentioned. The district bears the cost for the actual prescriptions. The administrative fee for employees in Local 617 is $5.78 per employee, and Local 3 is seven oh nine dollars per employee. Let me also indicate that this was a contract that has been in place prior to state takeover and has been continuously in place. So that's what Brokerage Concepts provides. You wanted to also talk about the Supplemental Fringe Benefits Correct. Fund? The Supplemental Fringe Benefits Fund is a third party administrator for NTU members, where that particular union handles their visual, dental, and prescription for their members, separate and distinct from all other union members. Um, the district bears the cost for the actual claims for all prescriptions, and the cost for services is 30000 a month. That, too, was in place prior to state takeover. Ms. Asante, have I missed anything? OK. Because um, this has been in place prior to state takeover, and because um, it has not gone out to bid, I do not feel in good faith that I should vote for these items because um, it's a third party and is the the revenue or the profit is not going to the state. It, it is to, to my um, good faith to pull these items from this resolution because these money that are that will be allocated should go to the classrooms and to their students and to the books because this amount of money, we do know for a fact that if we go out to bid, we may have somebody who, you know, who will come back with a cheaper rate. Therefore, I recommend, and I don't know if the board would like to, um, to also assist with this, to pull these items out, out of this resolution, which is line number E and F. Madam Chair. Yes. Madam Chair, just. Mr. Lewis. I, I just, uh, because of school starting within the next two weeks, I just highly, you know, on highly ask that we at least try to table this until, you know, next week pick it back up because I, I we got to think about our employees who are coming back in two weeks. We have to make sure that they're insured. Um, and I'm, I'm a person who have a family who, who work, and I wouldn't want my benefits held up because of something that uh, the district dropped the ball on. This is something that we was going to talk about. It should have been talked about in June when everybody was home. And, you know, we could have talked about it then. But right now, two weeks until everyone come back to school, we shouldn't, you know, uh, put our employees at the, in that type of danger or risk. Madam Chair. Ms. Carter. I mean, Ms. Fonseca. Crystal. Um, okay, let me just go back a little bit. But I just want to put on the record, um, I understand that in our budget we have line items, and I'm sure that this is a specific line item, so it can only be used for something in that 
area. Um, I'm pretty familiar with that. But I also want to say that it is very important that we put items out like this with such, you know, being that it's such a large number, we should be putting it out for bid because it makes it competitive and it gives us the opportunity to see what other prices are out there to benefit the district itself. Um, although I know that, that there's a line item for it. I'm not saying that we're taking that money and putting it somewhere else, but if we can pay less by going out to bid, we don't know unless we give it a shot. And being that we are responsible on voting on items like this, I think it's important that we continue that practice, not just specifically on this resolution, but just anything that's this large amount of money. Um, so I think that's really important. Um, I also want to say that not only should we put it out to bid for the finance part, you know, the whole large sum, but also you're saying that this has this company, we've been using it since we've been under local control. I mean, that's a long time. So there are other companies out there that can make this competitive. So I think that's even more of a reason for us to put it out for a bid. And lastly, to Mr. Lewis, um, I don't disagree with you because we all have families and insurance and all that stuff is very important. So I don't disagree with that. But had the district provided us with this information prior to, then that would give us the opportunity to vote on things in a timely manner. Um, I, my limited time here on the board as a new board member, I've had an issue with us receiving resolutions, stuff for us to approve with a short timing or something coming up like, like, okay, the contract is about to expire. We need to do this right now. Whereas if we're given ample timing, then we can research these matters and voice it out not only to the people that are in charge, but also let the community know that we are looking into matters and we're not just approving it because our backs are put up against the wall. Because that also puts us in a position of being irresponsible because we're just voting because we're being obligated to because it's affecting other families or whatever, teachers or, or the students. Um, so I just want to put that on the record because I've been saying it since I came on the board. We need to receive thorough information, we need to receive it in a timely manner because this right here is not, I don't feel like it's acceptable for us to just vote on it when we know that it should be going out for bid. So I just wanna, and I, I just appreciate that that is acknowledged. Ms. Lu Ms. Wilson? Can I provide, let me provide some points of clarity. Um, we have indicated as a district that we will be going out to bid. So it is our intent. This is a large bid. This is uh, an item that is complex in terms of the, it requires negotiations between the represented classes or unions and the district. You cannot just um, change providers. So we would have to get bids or get proposals that in turn are going to allow us to show that one, the uh, services and benefits provided are equal or better and that we actually have a savings. So that is going to take some time. Because this is not subject to public bidding, we have not bid it every year. At this point, the resolution that the board is considering tonight is not the awarding of a contract. It is an annual resolution that you will begin to do. As you are now transitioning to financial control, this is the first time that you are seeing this resolution as something annual. So we have health, we have, uh, health insurance, prescription, vision, dental, whether you table this resolution or not, those vendors will remain in place at the costs on the resolution because it is not the awarding of a contract. At the point when the bid occurs, there will be a discussion for awarding of contract once negotiations have occurred, should we be making changes. Mm -hmm. So it's not last minute, it is an annual Peace. It is not something you have done in the past because the board did not have financial control. So what we are beginning to do is, as part of our transition, to make sure that the annual things that a board does are done in the timely fashion that, are, that is required and that we do the things that we should be doing. So there are some things throughout the year 
that you will be doing at the appropriate time. And that is one of the pieces that under my office we are managing through board relations. So that is why you are seeing this particular resolution. It is to indicate for, as you note, the resolution says a one year period. Now, let us talk about the services. Actually, Bro can I just hold for one? Madam Chair, if I may, um, our Director of Labor Relations, Ms. Asante, wanted, she has information that also bears upon the further clarification, if, we could, uh, if she can address the, um, the board at this moment. Yes. Thank you, um, General Counsel. In terms of the supplemental, can you hear me? In terms of the supplemental fringe, uh, sorry, benefits, um, that, is a, that is contractual. So um, we, we really, the district has to negotiate that with the teachers' union if we wanted to go out and basically have another third-party administrator. That's a contractual piece. Um, the contract expired just last, um, this June. We're going to be commencing negotiations, and so that will be a topic for negotiations. But in terms of the cost, the bulk of the cost is actually to pay the claims, the prescription claims. The district is self-funded. So the, the, the millions of dollars is not really going to the third party administrator, brokerage concept of supplemental fringe. It's really going to pay actual claims because we're self-funded. And because we're self-funded, that's why we need a third party administrator. So that's a legal, you know, that's a legal, another legal provision. So we, can't, we can't be self-funded and also do the administration, so that's why we have third party. But we do hear your, in terms of brokerage concept, they've been the you know, third party administrator for 617 and local three, four years. So as, as BA said, that we will go out for bid on that. But I just want to point out that if this is tabled, that will put a hold on paying actual prescription claims for a large population of the district. Thank you. Now, what repercussions will we have if we just take out the item brokerage concept and leave everything as is? Can you just clarify that, that statement when you say take out the item, what do you mean by that? Remove brokerage item, remove brokerage concept instead of um, voting for the whole entire items, A to, let's vote for A to D and then F and just take out E. So you're, you're, you're stating what's the consequence if you table, is it item E? Item E. Uh, well, as Ms. Asante set forth, we are in contract with third party vendors. Um, the district should not be, and it's our fiduciary responsibility, to not be in breach of contract. Most importantly, health benefits, prescription benefits, these are not just state, but they're federal statutory obligations that we carry. What I would ask respectfully that the board consider is to bifurcate the need for the RFP, which we all acknowledge is necessary. And if I can have just one further note on explaining even that further, we are the largest, as you are aware, school district in the state of New Jersey. Our withdrawal of the state, um, we're, we're, in a, we're in a state health benefit pool. Our withdrawal would have significant impact, as you might envision, and just uh, extrapolate to that pool. So there is a tremendous amount of lead time that is necessary to go out for RFP, to also even give proper notice and prepare the state if we pull out, so to speak, of that particular plan. Um, without question, everyone is looking at this from the fiduciary responsibility standpoint, but specifically for the purposes of this evening, if we do not move forward with current existing contracts as we have in the past articulated here, that puts the district in a breach of contract. And more importantly, with items such as health care, I think everyone clearly understands, you know, without question, the uh, importance and significance of not disrupting or having any of that possibly terminated from any employee's uh, benefit package. Question? Ms. Basketball Richardson had a question, and then Mr. Ha um, Hassan. So my question, um, my topic actually goes back to the cap. So if we're finished with the other discussion, or when Ms. we're finished with the other discussion, then I would, um, I would ask that I speak at that time. Mr. Hassan. So my comments are in regards to uh, you know what we're talking about now with the insurance, the benefits. One, uh, you know, I feel like uh, as a, a local uh, school district. Uh, we should not have to be the foundation for the state's infrastructure in regards to their ability to provide uh, health benefits or services 
throughout the state of New Jersey. So, uh, you know, with the comments that were just made by general counsel, I would then ask, well, what percentage uh, do we actually contribute to the, to the funding um, of these uh, benefits throughout the state? Um, so been communicated that it would it would uh, be a grave impact that we were to pull out. But what other uh, school districts that are under state intervention are also funding this this um, pool uh, for the state's insurance and health benefits? Um, again, our focus should be to do what's in the best interest of our staff and our employees, and for those uh, within the North Public Schools District, not for everybody in the state of New Jersey. I think that's what we should be leading with, and those that should support all the action that we take in regards to this and everything else that we do here within this district. Ms. Wilson? No answer? Was that, is that, let me see if I get clear what your question is. One, you want to know what is our percentage of participation. That's something we're going to have to investigate because I can't answer that. I don't know that answer, right? What the general counsel indicated was that the state health benefits plan, for those of you who might remember, was created a couple years ago, mm -hmm. right? At that point in time, we were asked, well, not asked, basically told to participate, right? So we are in there. There are districts, surrounding districts, not state operated and not urban, who were also made to put, be put into that plan because it was more cost effective for the entire set of districts. There have been districts who have pulled out over the course of time. There have been districts who have been added over the course of time. Health benefits is something we have looked at in this district since I first got here, almost 19 years ago. So it is a topic that has been up for discussion. A health plan is determined based on the uh, claim history of the district. And every time we've looked at our claim history, I want to tell you that we stand pretty high up on the list. We have good claim history right, in terms of the number of claims, the types of claims, et cetera, um, which also affects the rate you pay. So there is a need to look at health benefits. It is a large cost driver in our budget. There is a need to look at it, and there is a need to seriously consider if there are savings and the benefits offered and services offered are equal to what people have today. We drive cost based on our volume. The largest group of our employees participate in the NTU. So the, to do something without bringing along one group or the other does not drive the ability to drive savings. So when we do it, we have to be sure that we are using our collective size to manage and to drive those savings. So it is going to take a process. We are going to go out for bid, and we think that we might be able to realize some savings. Mm -hmm. The truth mm -hmm. is yet to be told mm -hmm. and yet to be seen. Mm -hmm. So I have one more question. You might not be able to answer this now. I'll try. So with us being in, enrolled in this particular plan, mm -hmm. uh, who benefits more from that relationship, no public schools or the state? I don't have an exact answer, but what I can say to you, what I can say to you is, because that requires some analysis yeah. and some stuff we don't have access to. Realize, I'm, we are not going to have access to other districts' claim history, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. But our people who have, you know, asked for our claim history have, and we've analyzed it over the years, that's where I get my information. But I can't speak to others. I will say that we benefit because we're part of a group so we drive price. They benefit from our size, which helps them drive price. Thank you. Ms. Fonseca? I'm sorry. I just need clarity. Um, so you said that we were, were at the deadline. Um, I didn't get your, I didn't understand your name. 
I'm sorry. My name is Loretta Asante. Miss Loretta, I'm sorry. Um, you said that we need to that we will it'll be a conf like kind of like it's bad if we don't vote on this now because the term expired. Yes. Because we won't be able to pay. We won't be able to pay, but that means because are we at an expired date right now? Like this, uh, that's my question. Yes, no? No, Any the NTU contract. She, what she was referring to is that we're not expired on the health benefits, but the NTU's contract has now come to an end. Okay. So okay. because you have to negotiate health benefits, okay. that will be incorporated into the discussion and negotiation with the union in terms of what we negotiate for the next contract period. Which okay. would then allow us possibly to change health insurance providers. Okay. So my last question. It says in the resolution that it says provide coverage from July 1, 2015 to June 30th, 2016. Mm -hmm. So yes, we're, it does. we're that already is... doing it then, right? Because it's August 18th today. Well, yes, we have health insurance in place, but okay. it's an annual piece that you would normally do annually. So you do it your first meeting of the year. Okay. So the fiscal year. Okay. So is there any way that we can be like being that we know that this is an annual thing and it takes time to put all the other paperwork together that you mentioned earlier, which I totally understand. And I thank you for explaining it to everyone. But if we know that this is an annual thing that comes up, isn't there a way that we can speak about it prior to the current, like the fiscal year begins so that we can have clarity on all of this? In the future? Yes. Yes, you would. This is the first year that you have financial control. Mm -hmm. So you would not have spoken about it before. I get that. I get As that. As a transition, this is the first board meeting at which you can speak about it. In turn, whenever you are going to transition health insurance or any kind of large piece like this, you would want them to transition at the start of your fiscal year to realize the maximum amount of savings. So we would put a bid out. We would look for that bid to take effect for July 1st of next year. Prior to July 1st, you would approve the contract. The provider, should we choose to change plans, would then have to convert all our employee records. Right. New prescription cards have to be identified. Mm -hmm. Enrollment period needs to occur. Doctors time. need to be selected all of that. So you would see that happening over the course of the year, right? So I would say that that's at least five to six months. I'm going to defer to my labor and my HR expert, five to six months for a district our size to work it through, including the negotiations with our unions. Mm -hmm. That's correct. Thank you. Any other board members? I have a question. So what was your recommendation, Madam Chair? To pull out a line item E. And so, so if we pulled out line item E, that is what would stop the payment of coverage. Yes. Okay. Yes, just for the record, that would stop the, the payment. We would be in a breach of um, contract. More than likely, the unions would seek to sue the district, which they rightfully would be able to do so. And same applies for line, line item F? Uh, yeah. fringe yes. Benefit. Yes. yes, the same as with the supplemental fringe benefit, so because they are pursuant to collective bargain agreement um, benefits. I appreciate everyone's feedback, but again, Madam Chair, it's basically we're forced to vote on it because we don't want to affect everyone else. But at the same time, we don't want to cause all this friction towards the district as far as a suit and stuff like that. So what my recommendation to you, Chair, is that, and, and I don't mean it just for this specific resolution, I'm just saying it because we're discussing this one, is that if I understand we're in a transition period, but if we receive information with ample timing and we have clarity on a lot of this stuff, it would make it easier as the board on voting on items. 
because it's we're for we're basically up against the wall and we need to vote on it because we don't want to have all these other issues that everyone at the table has mentioned. So I think we need to really look into that, especially in a time like this where soon we'll have local control and we want to make sure everything is up to par. Okay. Any other board members have questions? So what's the end result? Leave it as is. We have no other choice but to vote. We're also not dealing with the agenda yet. Okay. You're not dealing with the no. next week's agenda, so you don't have to make this issue yet. I just uh, quickly, Madam SBA, when did you expect this going to RFP? If I may, that might resolve. I, I think Ms. Fonseca's issue is that this has kind of been presented. I, I know the finance committee, but she's looking for a little more lead time, and this has kind of been kind of sudden. So I think if she mapped out, but the process mapped out for in addition to the. I don't have a process map for when we would go out to bid, but as I indicated before, it is at least a six month period. My procurement director is in the audience, the labor person, and HR. Am I saying something that is incorrect? So it's going to take us a couple of months to put together the scope so that the scope is clear, so that when vendors respond, we have a clean and responsive bid, which allows us to then make a selection and make it in a timely manner, have the contract come before the board at the simultaneously, we need to do the uh, negotiations right, and then come before the board with a full package so that we can begin to implement for a July 1st. Because if I'm going to count savings, I want them from day one mm -hmm. of the fiscal year. Yep. Does that provide clarity? Yes, it does, and I'm very well aware of how tedious this process is. I'm very familiar with it, so I'm willing to provide any help I can to expedite this when we do start working on it, because I am aware of everything you just detailed, so thank you. Good, thank you for volunteering to be our advisory, our, I'm sorry, our board member who will assist with this process. Ms. Baskova Richardson? Yes, we are. Going back to the topic of the uh, corrective action cap regarding the North Internal Audit Unit's investigation of former Newark Public Schools Assistant Superintendent Tiffany Hardrick. Uh, I remember a few months ago when this uh, topic was on the floor for discussion um, that you said that you were going to seek additional um, restitution from Ms. Hardrick. Uh, up to the amount of the uh, net that she had paid, uh, that she had repaid one amount to the district, and that you were going to request an additional amount that would then bring that total to the net amount of the money that she was paid. So I'm just wondering um, if she has made any additional restitution to the district since that initial. Yes, all uh, net proceeds have been paid. Um, copies of that check have been maintained in files um, with um, our uh, SBA as well as with our um, HR department. Um, I can take a recess and go to my office and actually um, get a copy of the check if you like. The check was sent personally to my office. I viewed it. It was deposited. Uh, upon information and belief, we received that. I believe it was around the beginning of July. But all proceeds net have been tendered to the district as repayment. Okay, thank you. So uh, basically, um, we left the um, finance committee meeting yesterday with the understanding that the Corrective action, uh, corrective action plan that uh, we, the board, had uh, submitted would be um, presented to the state by the district. And now I understand that you're saying that that is not what is happening, and we're clear on that. But my question now is on the question of process, because basically we, the board, have a commitment to pass corrective action plan. The due date on that was initially to have been uh, 30 days after receiving the report, and that was extended and then extended again. We're all clear on that. Okay, so to get back to what, what I heard this evening, I heard you say that you would submit both the cap that the district proposed and the cap that the board as an entity 
as two separate documents as two separate caps to the state. So my question is, how can you submit anything to the state when we have not voted one way or the other? If we have a if we have an obligation to actually approve a plan, then I think whether we vote it up or down, that a plan has to be brought to us at our voting meeting next week for us to vote up or down. So I just want to be clear if that's the process. Because when you said you would send them up, I didn't know if you meant now that we vote on the first or with the process? No, I would never submit that. I, I could not legally submit that without a vote. What has to be submitted, and this is very um, spilled out um, very specifically in statute, it has to be uh, the vote, a record of the vote, which means that a record of the minutes would have to be attached to that, and then, of course, the actual resolution. And again, just to be uh, clear in my explanation, um, part of the reason as to why there's sort of this conundrum of this occasion um, for the first impression with the district is that, as the board is fully aware, the board does not yet have personnel with respect to a restoration of the CUSAC areas. So therefore, the cap does include um, a uh, component that speaks directly to personnel. And again, I sought guidance because I was not going to interpret um, on my own uh, volition what I could not at, at all uh, understand that the statute would provide for this exception. So that was the guidance that was given to me. But no, this would only be submitted at the point that a vote is taken, and I meant that to be uh, in present, I mean, uh, future tense, not current. So uh, the fact that we are actually at this point, unless there's some further negotiation or something changes before next Tuesday, that we are actually going to be in position in possession of two separate resolutions. Will we then be voting separately on these resolutions, or what process can we expect? To well, what I'm going to do, and um, well, strike that. What I have informed the state of is that, as you'll recall, I think it might have been about two months ago. Ms. Rodriguez may have the actual date. The state, um, the district, submitted a cap that was presented to the board. I believe it might have been about maybe two to three months ago. That is the cap that obviously was not satisfying to the board and that, that was revised. We are not seeking, I mean, without question, that would be voted in the negative. The reason I'm submitting, uh, I've been directed to submit the cap that the district has actually uh, prepared is for background information and for completion of just their, their actual analysis. The cap that I presume and I don't you know, want to speak for the board, obviously, that you will pass will be the cap that you're submitting, which is the revised cap. So that will be the cap that will have the minutes attached to a vote uh, with respect to um, being submitted to the OFAC uh, office. Um, it was very clear in records prior to now that the board was not going to pass, and I, I'm not trying to paraphrase here, but my recollection upon uh, information and belief was that it was um, there was no intention that the board would vote on the cap submitted to the actual, from the district. If that is a mistake of my interpretation, then clearly um, we can I can submit for the vote uh, the cap that the district has, in fact, also prepared. Okay, so this is getting you know, a little bit convoluted to me. So there, there was the first, there was the first cap that the district wrote, and then um, basically after the initial presentation, mm -hmm. okay, the district went back and revised that cap. Correct. So, am I hearing that that cap was then submitted to the state? Nothing has been submitted to the state because by statute, nothing can be submitted without a vote of this board. So no, I mean, we, we clearly have postponed, and again, with all due respect to the board, that request of postponement has been at the district's uh, request. We have documented it so that there is at all no uh, attribution of delay on this board. We have uh, provided the letters that substantiated that the delay was requested by us and that it was approved. So with respect to the cap, there has been no document whatsoever that has been officially submitted on behalf of this particular OFAC report. Clearly, there's been a lot of paper exchange here, but nothing has officially been submitted because until hopefully next week, the board has not voted on any cap thus far. However, there are, there are two caps. There is a cap from the district, and then there is the cap that the board is submitting. So why are not both of those caps? 
being submitted to the board for an official. The district will clearly, we can submit both, uh, and we will submit both, and then of course the board would vote accordingly as to each cap. Thank you. Okay. Ms. Hitchcock. Ms. Fonseca. Sorry. Um, so what is our current deadline? Because I know that we've postponed this several times. Right. So as of right now, where do we stand with the, that deadline? The last request that was made from our SBA to Steve Hoffman was to request an extension for the next uh, public meeting, which would be the meeting occurring next week. Okay. okay. Thank you. Is there a motion to approve Mr. Lewis's um, so moved. report? Second. Mr. Hassan. Who's second? Second. second. This is a motion to approve the finance committee report. <laughs> it's delivered by Vice Chair uh, Lewis, moved by Mr. Hassan, second by Ms. Carter. All in favor? Aye. Any opposed or abstain? Motion carries. Report approved. Next, we have the review of the agenda for the public meeting. I don't know if the two caps, as discussed by Ms. Basketball Richardson and Ms. Hitchcock, are on the agenda as presented to the board right now, so you would have to add those two items. The uh, cap for the, the cap as identified and approvable by the board is on the agenda, which is the OFAC cap board recommendations. We will now be looking to add the district cap. In addition, um, I sent over uh, yesterday a board resolution that is not put in the agenda, which is the halt to the one Newark universal enrollment. I would like for that to be included. Uh, that was, we received it, and I know Mr. Reed has been working with you to format and stuff, so once it's in the right format, we will add it to the agenda for next week. Uh, uh, are we taking votes to modify the agenda? Do we need that, yes. Council? Yes. We so then let us follow the proper practice. Are there any other additions or comments on the agenda before we do that? No. Okay. So can I have a uh, motion then to uh, accept the agenda for next week with the additional cap as set forth by Ms. Wilson and the additional resolution as uh, set forth by the chair? So moved. Second. Mr. Lewis on the move. Second by Mr. Hassan. Motion to approve the agenda. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed or abstain? Motion carries agenda approved for next week. Next item on the agenda. Public, particip public participation. You voted, Marquis. Uh, we got a vote on the computer. Yeah, Madam Chair, I've been reminded that all board members should be voted on the computer. Mr. Sonninger. Phil. Those from registered, ladies and gentlemen, this is the public participation portion of the meeting. As a reminder, time limits for all uh, speakers are enforced. There is no sharing or granting of speaking time to others. Speakers must be present when their name is called. Speakers are required to give their names and addresses. The public participation portion at business meetings is limited to 10 speakers on a first-come, first-served basis. Examples of unacceptable behavior that are not permitted include but are not limited to naming district employees and engaging in personal attacks, slurs, excessive loudness, calling out, yelling, generally disruptive behavior, attempt to disrupt the meeting or inciting others to do so. Public participation at board meetings is intended to allow individual members of the public the opportunity to address the board and the administration on issues of public concern, not as a forum for two-way dialogue with the board members or district officials. The superintendent's designee or madam chair may respond to questions either at the end of the session or responses may be provided at a later time. The superintendent's designee or chair may interrupt any speaker or terminate any individual speaking privilege if the comments are disruptive or obscene. An individual may be cautioned that a personally directed statement may be slanderous or defaming, and the individual may be liable for his or her statements.
attempts to hijack or filibuster the proceeding, repeated interrupting or badgering the board members or district officials, repetitive truculent speech or disregard of the rules of decorum are not tolerated and may subject the individual to removal from the meeting. If necessary, the meeting may be adjourned. The first speaker is Ms. Kathleen Witcher. Next speaker is Luis Rountree. Good evening, my name is Louise Roundtree, and I reside at 40 Washington Street in East Orange, New Jersey. Um, good evening. Good evening, thank you, Madam Chair, and to the, the board members. Um, I was uh, an employee of Newark Public Schools happily for 16 years. 12 of those years, I served as a substance awareness coordinator. And in, I'm quite sure you were in 2010, our department was eliminated. At that time, it really took me through a lot of changes because I actually adored my job. I loved working with the kids and I loved what we did. Uh, since that time, what came out of that whole situation was a program which I have founded. And that program is called the Academy of Unlimited Possibilities. And what it is, it's a program that is designed to develop character and skills to enhance social and emotional learning and development in our youth. Um, so the Academy of Unlimited Possibilities, which the name I chose, it took time for me to choose that name. Okay, <laughs> I'll hurry, I wanna get this through. <laughs> I, wanted, I wanted to expose our children because working in that uh, capacity for 12 years, I know what our children need. I know the behaviors, I know um, the consequences that they suffer, I know the knowledge that they lack in terms of a lot of decisions that they make. So the Academy is, is, a, is a program that was going to address those issues. Uh, it would bring them to an, a realization of who they are you know, in terms of the importance as a person. It's going to address character development in terms of honesty, integrity, respect, all of those things that our kids need. It will give them a chance or the platform to express their greatness. That's a part of our program where they can bring their talent forth. Um, so out of this, uh, because what happened was I had a chance to do a survey with some seventh and eighth, seventh and eighth graders. Is that me again? Seventh and eighth graders on values and morals. And surprisingly, I was I found that so many of our our youth they are not aware of of is that me of the values and morals that they should have in growing up to navigate through this life. So I would like for my pro, I did bring a package for you to see. Um, hopefully everyone can take a look at it, it's six modules. I would like for this program to be considered to be a part of the district. And I would, I would like for it to be looked at further by a committee. Um, I, would, I would love to have my program in the Newark Public Schools because these are our children and I know that this program would benefit our kids. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Next we have Ms. Sheila Montague. Then, then we have Mr. Jimmy White. Good evening. Um, my name is Jimmy White. Um, I reside at 63 Sherman Avenue, North New Jersey, District 47, South Ward. Cool. Um, there's a couple of um, issues um, that that strikes them. First, first of all, um, uh, I'm I'm starting to learn some some things that's going on here. I understand that you guys represent the district. Yeah, yes, um, for the superintendent. The, the the problem with that is we we have a lot of issues involving contracts, health um, teachers being uh not being placed placed in um, in schools, and um, just staff staff development issues, healthcare issues. But the, but the man that's in charge isn't here. We have the biggest um, budget, as said as we all repeated time and time again, that. This, that that man isn't here, Mr. Surf isn't here, and we always ask. And I've been, I said in the meetings in the back where, where the board members continue to ask these guys questions. They're represented. They always say we don't know or we don't have the information. 
So I wonder when is the board is going to say, you know what, I'm tired of asking these guys questions. I, you know what I think y'all should do? I think y'all should give them a letter for the superintendent to sign to give y'all the information that y'all need. Because the, all the I don't knows, you know, it's not helping our students. It's not helping us whatsoever. So they, they come in and they just get, they, they the represent, they, they're like the community relations department of a company. You know, they're going to call, they're going to listen to you, they're going to talk to you, to the community, but you're never going to get to the CEO. But the difference between our district and other school districts, because I was just in Cranford, and my, um, my niece, and I decided to go to that, uh, to, that, to that school, Livingston Avenue School, just to see how things work. And that's, if they had a, a problem with their teachers receiving health care or uh, 120 vacancies, <laughs> their superintendent would be there because those are million-dollar issues. Those million-dollar issues need the million-dollar man sitting there, and that million-dollar man doesn't have to answer questions. So we get five people up there to saying they don't know. And our board is, is accepting this, <laughs> is accepting this, you know, for, I guess, for the past four years, and I guess that it's time to stop. And so he's going to show up next week to, sh to um, have um, this, do this political grandstand and say, you know what, this is my plan. But when we needed you for a plan, when we have a mil million dollar problems sitting right here at the table and our board members aren't getting um, documents when they're supposed to get documents, and et cetera, you're nowhere to be found. And you're going to leave that meeting probably early and say you got somewhere to go like every, every other person who comes in our community and um, say they're in charge. So I'm just basically I'm up here. I can I can talk about what's in the budget as far as six months as uh, as far as um, what was it? Sixty percent as far as KSAC is concerned. QSAC. QSAC is concerned. The state is in charge. What I what I fell to understand is the state is in charge. Why aren't we holding the state accountable accountable for our results? They the buck stops with them. They seem to say no to a bunch of different things. But as soon as they say, you know what, I need y'all need y'all to cut some items, then y'all have to cut items. But when y'all need something to be improved, they, they're nowhere to be found. So I think the board need to step up and say. You know, I'm tired of y'all stating y'all book. I'm tired of these five people coming here and not having any answers. <laughs> and I guess this is not the time for me to say this, but I am running for school board next April. And from that, from this point on, I'm not going to take us getting community representatives to say they don't know, because that's what these guys are saying. I'm tired of you, you, because she had great questions. Her, her, her report was a great report. It was filled with numbers. It was filled with everything you need from the breakdown of from every school of where, where the problem is. And they, and she couldn't get any answers. Miss Wilshire was sitting here. She retired four years ago, five years ago, I believe. It was just a little bit when I left Malcolm X Bass High School in 2006. And they could pull up, if they had a problem with her, they'll pull up her resume from 1980s or 1970 when she started working. But you can't find one resume for current teachers since March. I find that hard to believe. You know, so, you know, we taking these answers, but that's why I was in the back. I was telling her, you know, speak up, you know, don't don't you know, tell them that 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 is unacceptable. Y'all know y'all can get the answers. I, you know what I think? Stop, stop asking. Mr. White, thank you very go much. The, go to the state, put in an Oprah request and get your answers from them because they're not they're going to sit there and say they don't know. And, and that's their job. That's what they Mr. White, thank you very much. Your time is up. not going to sit in that seat for three hours and listen to all this. So he's going to pay good, pay them good money, I might, might add, for them to sit there and give you the I don't know. Because that's Mr. what they do in our neighborhood. Thank you very so, much. Um, that's, you know, that's just my perspective on it. And that's it. I, I had a, a bunch of questions, but that's, that's what it is. Oh, but I would also like the... Thank um, you very uh, much, Mr. Also, White. Like, Your time is up. Also, like to know why aren't we using best practices within our schools? Every school that's successful have smaller classroom sizes. We and, and I was I was in Cranford today. Mr. White, and they your time is up. Students per class, we have but twenty eight to thirty five. They, and y'all evaluate our teachers in, in failing circumstances. Like, how do you do that? Then you lay them off, but then she said, Mr. White. tell you they have no certified teachers. What about all the teachers they laid off that came Anderson laid off that was certified? Why don't you Mr. Call them White. And ask them, do they still want to work? I bet you they still want to work. Your so point we, is understood. And say she don't know that where the talent is. But she was there the whole four years when Cammy Anderson laid off all those teachers. Mr. So White. Who is this? To, to answer your question and your question. Mr. Your White, question. thank you very much. I'm sorry. Thank you. Next we have, I do not have a last name, but it's John. John from NTU. 
Then we have Mr. Lucius Jones. Happy summer, board members. <laughs> you know, it has been a major, major, major summer. And as the new commissioner has said of the board, uh, we have some winners and we have some losers. That's what he said at the state board meeting, that Newark is going to have some winners and some looters, losers. Board members, I come to talk to you today very briefly, I hope. But please set the clock for five minutes. I hope that is done. Because that clock been doing everything but on time. <laughs> okay. Ms. Pre Ms. President, is the clock set correctly? Ms. Jones? Jones, the clock has been set for five minutes. Very good. My, my concern goes back to when Ivy Hill School was created, was developed. Ivy School Hill School has had four principals and it's only been open since what? Uh, 2000 and what, nine, 2008. We've had four to five principals. Our last principal, we were told, our last, we were last told at Ivy Hill that we were going to be a repurposed school. And then they snatched the principal out. And she met with the superintendent at that time and, uh, 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 and uh, 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 the chief talent officer, to, a part of an investigation. Now I come up here today and I hear Ivy Hill don't have this many teachers. I hear University don't have this many teachers. And Arts High don't have this many teachers. Why do I have a problem with that personally? Because those are all the schools my kids go to. <laughs> and I have a major, major problem with that because last year, my daughter who had chemistry took chemistry half a period and, and, and in, uh, some type of biology the other half a period and go in back to chemistry because they didn't have a teacher. We have a major, major issues here in this district and the cause of those issues ha could be because we got people who should be involved in talent working on the budget. They don't know nothing about a budget. It's not a part of their job description to know a thing about the budget. But they are turning around here working on a budget and we don't have teachers in the classroom. And then we turn back around to, to bring more insult, we have on QSAT rated high in 80%, I don't know, 80%, 90% for finance. But my opinion is that we won't have finance board members because they don't want y'all voted on nothing that they're having any power. So what they intend to do is take finance away from you because they spent all of last year Screwing it up. Amen. Just screwing it up. Making sure that you, when you do, when you get assessed for QSAT, you will not, you will find that the score for finance, if allowed, will drop to 60%. Patterson Board and Jersey City Board said what? The only thing better than local control is local control. So you can, we can sit here and we can dance and we can fiddle and we can do all these different things. But I am sitting here telling you that the kids in the schools are hurting. They're hurting. They don't have, because of lack of books, lack of planning, lack of resources, turnaround school, repurpose school, reorganize school, renew school. They just pull, they just going inside any old bag and pulling out any word they can come up with. We got a match for you want to be, go to this school, a match you want to go to that school. And then Ms. Rodriguez said, you got a match to go for that employee to that school or match. To, they matching all over the place, but nobody being matched with nothing. <laughs> it sounds like to me, organized chaos. Networks all over the city. Ivy Hill has four elementary schools. Each and every one of them has a different assistant superintendent. What does that tell you? They don't want the community organized. They don't want the parents talking to one another. And they want us going to four different assistant superintendents because they want to cause chaos for us. But I have found my way. 
through all of this mess. That's why I can get up here and speak the way I speak today. Because there are nobody training the parents at the schools. We don't have any workshops. There's no parent engagement. I don't know where the title money, one money is going. So that's my job this year. To go out there in that West Ward and organize every single parent we can and train them to come right back here and engage. So I look to see, so when we pack the room, we want to make sure that every single board member and every senior district employee that needs to know will know that the parent will be empowered because we took the steps of saying we're going to start with grassroots to train the parents what they should know and what they should do with it. Because it doesn't make sense for me to know as much as I do know and don't share it with the rest of the world. Thank you. Have a nice day. Thank you very much, Mr. Jones. Next, we have Ms. Frida Barrow. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening, board members. My name is Frida Barrow. I live at 20 Irving Ave, Newark, New Jersey. Um, as I was sitting here, I just uh, typed some things that were on my mind. I saw there weren't too many speakers on the list. And um, here we go. One Newark is one hassle for families like mine. My granddaughter is a first grader with an IEP at George Washington Carver Elementary School our neighborhood school. Her brother would have been able to attend that same school for pre-K if it were not for the One Nork enrollment plan. This September, my grandson would have to be driven to another location instead of our neighborhood school with his sister as it should be. That's my family's choice. Secondly, I am an elementary school teacher who has been at George Washington Carver Elementary School since 1999. On September 1, I will be at Hawthorne Avenue School. The only reason for this, to my knowledge, is because I opted not to sign the EWA, the Extended Work Agreement. I did not sign because it is clear that by signing the EWA, I am aware that this document is subject to changes that are not indicated. The EWA also states that the employee is aware that they will not be protected by parts of collective bargaining agreement between NPS and NTU. It does not indicate what parts. I recently found out that the school I've been assigned to is also a turnaround school with an extended school day. None of this makes sense to me. And to date, no one has been able to provide me with an explanation. As a community member and an educator, I am deeply concerned that these changes will not benefit the school's population or the community. It is painfully obvious that we need local control immediately. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Barrow. Next we have Ms. Denise Cole. Denise Cole, 2 Kira Avenue, apartment 5D in Newark. Been attending these board meetings for the last three years. And I see new faces here. I see people sitting over there and people that have been sitting there. And he, with the suit and tie, never have an answer to any question. He can't give you a policy or procedure. And I've been sitting here for the last four years. And all the vacancies you said, like, really? Really? I've been coming to the board meetings. These same vacancies existed under... Hassan Rashan. The same vacancies before school ended last this semester that we were still did not have permanent teachers that were qualified to teach in all our classes. And that's when before that you all just got voted in. We ended the school year not being fully staffed. Now we're going to begin the school year again, not fully staffed. Don't look at me crazy, Rashad Hassan, because you sat there and you know I'm not lying. This is not tolerable. It is sad that you guys sit here and you read that and you honestly believe anybody over there going to give you information because I've been sitting here for the last four years and they ain't came back with no information each time you ask. 
I gave them a list of questions, all of you, matter of fact, but y'all didn't get it personally because I was told by head counsel, Ms. Hitchcock, to give it to the lady that was at the public meeting so that everybody could share. This was back in April or May. My questions are still pending. I didn't even get a response by letter saying, we got your questions because I submitted it through head counsel to be disseminated down to the superintendent and to every board member. I still didn't get a letter, but I did get a call a couple of months ago by, um, I can't say, Mr. Travis. And then I got a call the other day by Mr. Travis and said he was still working on the questions along with somebody in her office. So I got I did get two phone calls eventually. And he wanted to know where I stood where I stood on my questions. And I told him I stood where I stood last year because just because surf came don't mean my issues change. Because I've been coming here and to listen to your reports and these new people faces sitting up here. She ain't new. He ain't new. He's not new. I've never seen her and she's been here for 10 years and I've never seen the guy in the middle. So at the end of the day, we got people sitting here that because Surf is now supposed to come to the next meeting, they all of a sudden is interested. Really? I am shocked that this elected board keep allowing them to come here. I want Mr. Rashawn to lead a group of North public school parents like he led them 100 charter school parents to shut one North down to shut the Board of Education down until he can get palatable answers to his questions. Because he asks good questions sometime in reference to North Public School. But I bet you if we took that $226 million going to the charter schools and said we're not giving that money to them because we're going to replenish our North Public Schools, I bet you he'll lead 100 parents. So when is these elected board members going to lead? 5,000 parents to shut this Board of Education down, to kick surf out of our town, to get Miss Hitchcock and Miss Wilson to do what they're supposed to do with our budget for our children. I'm tired. This is nothing new. I'm tired. I'm fed up. I'm frustrated. I don't, I mean, like, I'm not going to get an answer. I know I'm going to sit here and I know in three more months, I'm still going to be, Mr. Travis, still going to be telling me they working on my questions. <laughs> so at the end of the day, I need some help. And I don't know who here can help our children because I stand here for parents. I stand here for children in all five wards. I stand here for ESL, who non-speaking English students, the special needs students who not being served in charters nor public schools. This is ridiculous. And at some point, I agree with my North Ward person who stood up here and talked. We now have to organize board elect the board if you want to be sitting in those seats and some of you only sitting here because two council seats going to be free and if you think I'm going even tell anybody to vote for anybody on this board to sit in city council when all you keep doing here is coming here asking these people for the same questions since you've been elected and you ain't got no answer and you haven't taken the proactive stand for Newark public school children you're wrong pay attention Newark Community must now begin to pay attention. We need to look at all these faces sitting up here that ain't doing nothing, that's getting paid the big money to not doing nothing. He still ain't get me my answer that I last asked the last board meeting about the summer school program. He sidestepped it, he sidestepped it, he sidestepped it. And we pay for children from charter schools to go to our North public school system when they're a whole separate district. And people from different districts must pay to go to your summer school. But yet, they attended our summer schools free. He told me it was because they were Newark residents. But I called Trenton personally, and Trenton said, charter schools are a separate district. So if you're a separate district, how did you go to our Newark public school system for free? And we didn't collect money. Where are your answers to that, Mr. Hassan Rashan? Give me an answer next board meeting. You could do it next board meeting. Ms. Cole? But at the end of the day, I'm going to shut this down by saying, we need some answers, and we need some legitimate answers and some legitimate action. Thank you very much, Ms. Cole. Next, we have Ms. Maureen Robinson. Good evening, Maureen Robinson, 428 Doyle Street, Elizabeth, New Jersey. Good evening. A special education teacher at Central High School. 
highly qualified special education teacher. I've been in the district 14 years. I've only had one unsatisfactory evaluation. I didn't come to speak uh, tonight. I just wanted to listen, but I want to say, um, because I've accomplished my mission and my goal, and I feel good about that, uh, I'm going to respond to Mrs. Carter uh, and the EWPS. Uh, I'm going to give you my name and my number, and I'm going to share some information with you about EWPS, because you have been misled in some of the stuff, not all of it, but some, some of it. Um, I don't think I can talk about me because I think that's against their policy, but you and I can talk. So I'm going to give you my name and my number, and I want, to, I want you to call me, and if you need any help or anything like that. What, two of the things that come into play with principals and, and teachers being assigned is favoritism and belonging to cliques, okay? If they want to pick up you, pick you up, they'll pick you up. If they don't want to pick you up, if you're not a part of the in crowd or their cliques, they won't pick you up, okay? So I'm going to share that with you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Robinson. That's it. That's it. Good. So we have a public participation, Madam Chair. Next item on the agenda: old new business. Old new business is the next item on the agenda. Board Member Pascoe Richardson. Yes. Um, when I was coming in uh, to the building today, I noticed that there's a picture up of a new student rep. However, I don't remember hearing anything about a selection process or anything. So I'd just like to be updated as to how and when the student representative from the board was selected. Ms. Deering, I hope you're not trying to leave. You almost <laughs> made it, Ms. Deering, not quite. <laughs> um, we did go through a selection process. Nancy, can I ask that you give a brief report? seven applicants. And as I said to Vice Chair Lewis, you know, the process, we had student representatives uh, on the interview panel, and we didn't have an opportunity at this time to extend that offer to board members. That's Pastor Lewis. Uh, I, w I want to thank Ms. Stern for her uh, hard work, but I think I think we have um well, she she outlined a, a issue that I have. The issue I have is our children are not motivated to be in this role anymore. And I know when I was in high school, I was in arts high school. You know, we used to compete to get our names in the hat or whatever to try to be a part of the student rep process or a part of the, uh, Ms. Uh, Ms. Bolden had uh, a board. She had the student rep, and then the student rep had a board that he, that he or she reported to um, because there was two representatives from each school that was appointed to meet with the student rep. So I just think we need to find ways to Make it more motivating and attain, you know, you know, make it more of a student desire to want to be a part of, because it's hurting to hear that it's a process that you know was in place when I was a student here, and we we fought to get that position. It was like you know, a real election process, and and now that our students not even interested in it, we we have to rethink this whole process. Miss Deering? I think it's your public school failure to reach out to those appropriate students. 
every school that would be honored to sit on that board as a speaker. Ms. Deering? Ms. So, Deering? Can I just say that? Did they do that? That's unacceptable. The process is the process, and the process was developed by a former student board rep. And so one of the things that will be different in this coming year is that we have a student leadership institute where we will have an opportunity to reach out to more students in all the schools. And so if students are not aware, they can't, you're right. If they're not aware, they can't participate. But we do have plans to expand the reach and start earlier. May I ask what was the- Ms. Uh, Basco, no, Ms. Basco, had, had a question. I'm sorry. Ms. Basco Richardson, you defer? Okay, Ms. Carter. I was gonna ask, may I ask what was the process of recruitment um, as well as selection? I don't know if I missed it, sorry. The process is the same that it has been every year. We send out the criteria to the principals and we send it out through the Student Leadership Institute and interested students apply. And so we had seven participants this year. And how was the participant selected? They're nominated by their peers. Ms. Pascoe Richardson? So I just want to um, wait, say one out of the seven. Was, um, Jerry, but the process has um, changed over the years. The initial process was uh, a large uh, student uh, body of uh, student representation from every high school. And this goes back to. Um, 2008 and before that there were student leaders identified in every high school by the coaches, by the teachers in that school, and they formed the student leadership. They came together and met on a monthly basis, and from that entire body, a, uh, the student representative no, because it's already in. representative was elected. I think it was probably... Um, I don't remember exactly what year that that was changed to more of a selection process. But, you know, I, I understand that there are always, you know, difficulties in these processes. But I would simply like to suggest that a more open and a more democratic process be used, whereas a larger group of students can elect their student rep. Because if we don't do that, then what we're doing is failing to develop civic leaders, failing to teach our students democracy as imperfect as it is, and failing to prepare them to participate in the adult world. So I would simply you know, hope that moving forward that there's a more, a broader reach, more inclusive and a democratic process. And we Thanks. can certainly look at that. Um, Again, I asked earlier, I understand that they're nominated. I wanted to know how were they chosen from the district? How did you choose the one oh, of the I'm seven? Sorry. There was an interview process that included a panel of students and one administrator. And then I also um, wanted to know, was the board made aware that you were looking um, for students so that we could have engaged the community um, ourselves to help put the word out there through means at which um, we're able, may, we may have more access being that we live here. We may be able to contact and connect with our students. Um, That's a good point. I thought it was, and I'm not gonna say that I can definitely remember, but I do remember reaching out to some board liaisons back then to make sure that you all knew. When was um, back then? It's back in March. But, you know, now that I'm hearing this, and I know that this has been a, a concern for a while, but uh, we will certainly take your comments and your concerns under advisement, and we will revisit the process uh, this coming year. Thank you. Um, just for the record, um, Ms. Deering, um, the board was not aware um, that there you know, was a selection process okay. going to be taking place. And um, there's one thing that, that you had mentioned that in May you extended um, one more time. And at that point, I was the chair um, of the board. And fortunately, I didn't even know about it. Uh, Mr. Vice, Mr. Lewis? Uh, who, who is the student at what school? His name is Nathan Dos Santos, and he's from Eastside. He will be presented to the public in the September meeting. <laughs> that made Mr. Sellinger happy. <laughs> Madam Chair. Mr. Jackson. Good evening again. I'm going to be real brief. 
uh, I want to submit on record um, if we can have an update and a report of the One Nork Enrollment and or Family Support Center. And that update should be given by a representative or the person running that department. Um, I had the opportunity to visit the center. I also plan to visit the center again next week while I'm on vacation and also make a few school visits. Um, but I think it is important that we get a, a formal update from um, that department. Uh, it would have gone great with this meeting, but if we can have that at our next public meeting. Thank you very much, Mr. Jackson. Mr. Lewis? I just want to... Um a second what Mr. Jackson just said and also um the lot the lot, um I also had a few parents that went there and also you know mentioned that they were sent by board members and the staff there one don't even know our you don't even don't know our names or they don't respect the fact that we send somebody there um I had an incident, I, I talked to Madam B.A. about it, um, where one of the persons that's supposed to be directing down there laughed at a parent when he said they were sent by me and said, why did I send them there? Why else would I send them there for you to help them? I told them who to ask for and let them know that I sent them for help. One of the parents, didn't, she barely spoke English, and she was highly offended. One that I sent her there, and, and he laughed in her face. And secondly, he didn't help her. He passed her off to another employee who then indicated to her that he couldn't help her. So I, I think it's very discouraging when we send people down there and they can't get help and we send them to individuals to get help. And then in return, we as board members have to turn around and get the superintendent involved. And then when the superintendent gets involved, things happen. It get handled. We shouldn't have to go to the superintendent every time we want something to be resolved. We are elected board members, and we need to be respected as board members in this district. That's all I'm out to say for that, for now. Any other board members? Can we can we get a response from uh, or assurance from a district, a cabinet from the superintendent's office stating that someone will be able to report on the enrollment center? We are, the superintendent is absent tonight because of a previous engagement. He had a personal one yes. uh, prior to his taking this job. So that is why he is not present. Yes. Um, we have been discussing the district report and from, if memory serves me correct, an enrollment piece is included. Uh, yeah, I'm hearing from my team that an enrollment piece is included and an enrollment center update and report will be presented at next week's board meeting. Okay, Madam, Madam BA, with all due respect, um, I'm asking that someone from that department, particularly the department head, um, as I know to be Mr. Ruben Roberts who runs the enrollment center, if I'm mistaken, please correct me, um, if he can come and present uh, and the reason why I'm asking is because, you know, again, department heads should be able to report out on their departments. Um, I spoke with Mr. Ruben Roberts. We had a good conversation. Um, so I think it would be, um, it would be um, not necessarily pleasing, but, um, you know, a duty for Mr. Roberts to come in and report to the body of the board in a formal manner. Let me say this, Superintendent Cerf is new to the district. I am unsure of his presentation style or wishes. Um, I will say that it will be included in his report and we will ensure that the appropriate staff are present to respond to questions. So he may not present it. I can't answer that at this time. Okay, and, and with also with that being said, um, I'm gonna also request that all executive staff report to the next public meeting. Um, we already know general counsel, the BA, yes, but I'm also asking all assistant superintendents and assistants uh, accompany uh, the next uh, public meeting. 
Uh, we appreciate your request. The superintendent will direct his staff as is appropriate. Wonderful. Thank you. I would like to make um, a request regarding the enrollment center. Um, I do know for a fact that we have um, schools and classroom sizes that are over its capacity. I just wanted to know um, in a school and per grade, um, how, how many students we have um, in the classroom, how many students are we over enrolled, and also what is going to be the, the protocol to accommodate these students that are over enrolled in the classroom. Chair Perillo, um, school districts start on September 3rd or the Monday after Labor Day. Uh, there is a practice in this district for late registration in terms of classes. So I would say that to get an accurate report, two weeks into the school year might be a better time for us to be able to tell you what our class sizes look like when everything sort of settles down. If you remember and note, the actual account of children on roll is not actually taken by the state until October 15th for that very reason. So I'm not saying, no, we would not provide that information, but I think it is best to wait for the district to settle and get things in place. There is probably going to be some type of audit that our staff will do as we have done in years past. So I will defer that request. Please submit it in writing and I will speak with the appropriate parties on staff to determine when is a good time to take that count. Okay? Mr. Lewis. I'm still on I'm waiting for my update on pathways. Um, we I know that Mr. Tananian is not in charge of special education, so I'm still looking for that update. Mr. I for, Lewis, I for in June. Okay, Mr. Lewis and all board members, can I ask for your patience? And I will ask that starting today. All requests be submitted in writing to the chair. Whether you've submitted them in June, we're in a new fiscal year, we're gonna start from today. I have an Office of Board Relations. All of you know that I have been assigned to work with them. And in order to have proper practice, proper protocol, we will submit our requests to the board chair and we will submit them to the Office of Board Relations. I will point out Mr. Reed, and I will point out Ms. Gelber. They will both be working to ensure and tracking those requests. The reason I am asking for requests in writing, we are in a board meeting. It is a public entity, public activity. If we are answering questions, sometimes we might miss the gist and the content that you are looking for. When they are in writing, there can be no mistake, and we will track them. That is the request I am making respectfully to the board. Madam Chair? So, Mr. Um, Lewis? So, uh, I'm emailing it to Madam Chair right now. Uh, update on the pathways, special education. Also, we need an update on what's happening with transportation for special education. Also, we need an update on the IEP audit as well. Thank you. One other piece that I will request respectfully is that we provide some sort of specificity to our requests so that it is not broad and general. I understand what an update means, but an update on transportation, I can clearly tell you what transportation we're offering, the fact that our transportation bids have been done, things like that. But on special ed, um, or an update on special ed is a little bit too broad. I would like some more specificity, please. So the more specific, excuse me, Mr. 
Lewis, I didn't mean to interrupt you. The more specific we can be on our requests, the more timely the responses can be by staff, and the more direct and focused those responses can be, and the more satisfactory our level of service to you will be. So, Madam Bia, so you said more specific with special education. So what I'm talking about is vacancies, I'm talking about services that have been cut. I'm talking about Title One, Title One for all um, fund, funding, and what it's being used for, and the where this money being reallocated to. And I'm also talking about where did the money from uh, Berlin go that was supposed to be allocated for those children who attended Berlin. Madam Chair. Yes. The request will come to you in writing, and it will be submitted to the Board Relations Group, correct? I would think, Ms. Uh, Madam SBA and Mr. Lewis, I think some of that sounds like a flowing discussion that might be more appropriate for curriculum, if I'm not mistaken, for the Curriculum Committee. Closed, I think, if I remember correctly, probably four to five years. So tracking those dollars is going to take some time over several fiscal years. It's not a request that I have at the spur or tip of my fingers. Berlin, Berlin is two years, ain't it? Is it no, ABC, is ABC then Berlin, so it's only two years. Mr. Ms. Wilson, um, I have a question regarding the support center, which is a statement that was issued by our superintendent. Can you please?